What a weekend at IMS. And the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500 hasn't even happened yet. The type of drama that you're going to find at qualifications in the lead up to the greatest spectacle in racing. All the drama delivered yesterday at the track. Jimmy Cook, James Boyd, and Eddie Garrison here on the Fan Midday Show. Hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Practice sessions going on at IMS today. And, of course, you'll have Carb Day for final fine-tuning everything before the 107th running of the greatest spectacle in racing. But first, we begin with a high-powered sports weekend. We're going to get into the NBA playoffs as, kind of shockingly to some degree, both conference finals find a team up three games to none. We'll have a discussion in the 1 o'clock hour if there's any path for a comeback for either one of these teams. We might mix in a little bit of that here in this first segment, but we begin with the drama that's always going to unfold when bump day arrives. And for a while, it looked like Graham Rahal was going to be securely in this field for the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. For those that don't know with qualifications... Four drivers, three spots up for grabs, and if you decide to take a second run after your first initial run in that hour qualifying window, you forego the time you had, or you forego the speeds, rather, you registered before with your four-lap average. So if you're locked in the field, why would you go out and chance it? Like, there's there's no reason to, to do that. Put pressure on whoever has to make it. And the guy that had to make it was Jack Harvey. He gets a final run out there. It doesn't go the way he wanted it to, but there's still time on the clock. They roll the dice one more time, and he winds up just edging Graham Rahal to qualify for the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. And as I bring James and Eddie into the fray here on a Monday, James, we talk a lot about the human element in sport, and I get it regardless of if it's an NBA athlete, NFL athlete, or an IndyCar athlete. At some point, you're like, oh, well, these guys have everything in the world. Why, why would you feel bad for them? Like, look at look at the lives they have. But there's still so much human emotion in the sport. And yesterday, when Graham Rahal was delivering post-qualification session with the media right there on the track, and he starts to break down and leave, and you see then Jack Harvey having his interviews, and, and he's still very bittersweet about it because he bumps out a teammate at the end of the day, you just want to qualify teammate or not. You want to make it, but you still feel bad for your friend and teammate. And Jack Harvey is being consoled by his family. It is. It's a very raw, emotional day within that sport and within this race, because even though IndyCar as a whole has marquee events weekend to weekend, this is the creme de la creme. This is the Super Bowl. And to miss out on it and have to wait for a year, it's gut wrenching. And that's Graham Rahal's reality today here on a Monday. Yeah, I think that's – it's one of those things where you commend him for the way he stood tall after it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things where, as a reporter, as a media member, you have to remember how much it means to these people to do this. We can dismiss the wins and losses because, to us, there's always another race or another competition. And, quite honestly, we'll flip the page and go on with the next story. Mm-hmm. But for him, that is his story. And so I thought the way he handled it was very classy. Um, Obviously, it's a unique situation because you want your team to to succeed. But I don't even want to use the word selfishly, but just from a personal standpoint, you want to succeed. You want a shot to be in the field. You want a shot to be in the race that, you know, is, is one of the most famous in the world. So I can understand where he's coming from. And I just don't know how I would have handled that. So I commend him for the way that he did, even though it was extremely hard to sort of face the music when you see uh, the failure, I guess, in real time. And I think that that's what makes being in a field or profession of performance and entertainment so unique. You know, if we mess up in our day to day lives or on our jobs, we usually do not have to answer it like that no face in the music you know what i mean like you know and what's the worst we could do on air you know mess up if we forget a name or say the wrong year for something you know whoop-de-doo but it's not like we're going out there and laying it all on the line and you come up just short so um i always like to see people when they go through those moments and how they respond to it and i thought that his character really showed through yeah across the board 
from Graham, from Jack Harvey, from, from all that were interviewed throughout that process, everybody showed world class, as you would expect from these drivers. And then you have, obviously have that followed up with, with, with just the fight for pole position and Alex Pelot continuing his dominance in the month of May. We're going to get into that as the week rolls on. But there's a finality to it within qualifications where... I'm just trying to think like what there's not really another sport equivalent to it because all that's happening to Graham Rahal in that moment is he's sitting in his car waiting, like just seeing how this all plays out. He knows he's not going to get another one out there when Jack Harvey and his team decide we're going to give it one more go. And like, I I guess the equivalent would be if you, and this isn't Eddie, you can weigh in on this too. Perhaps I'm being too off the board here, but like because of what's at stake, it would almost be like if you if you fouled out or did something in like a, a major championship game where you're helplessly sitting there. There's nothing you can do to impact the outcome. And it's even hard to make that comparison because it's such an individual sport in that moment. In qualification, yeah. it's not really uh, you're, you're obviously you're not racing against anybody else. You're going against the field, but there's no one else on the track but you. And yeah. it's a helpless feeling if you're unable to be in control of your own destiny, be in control of it in that moment and just have to sit and watch and let it all play out. Yeah, and I think what adds to it is is Graham kind of referenced retirement, you know, a, a little bit earlier, and so that's probably weighing on him too. Is like, how many more chances am I going to get at this, or is this it? And so, those are the things that um, I think for us just reminds us of the human nature of sports and how beautifully cruel it can be sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, because for one team, for one, you know, for one driver, it, it can be the best moment when you just sneak in. And then for the other, you know, other side of it, when you kind of get pushed out, it, it hurts, it stings. And I think that's why we love sports too, because obviously you can't always have winners. Um, everyone can't get a trophy, but um, to be in the thick of it, to give yourself a chance is uh, what you ask for. And I think that it's easier said than done um, when you have to face coming up short. But uh, I thought the field itself though was, pretty incredible pretty fast obviously and so um there's a lot of great competition out there and it should continue heading into you know the the real deal this upcoming weekend it was 44 ten thousandths of a second over the 10 mile qualifying run of the last attempt of the session that jack harvey's able to edge his ray hall letterman lanigan racing teammate jack harvey does to graham ray hall and on the other side of that coin we talk a lot about the emotion that's going through uh, Graham Ray Hall, and of course, it was emphasized a ton that 30 years ago, his father Bobby Ray Hall experienced the exact same thing, got bumped, and, and just the, the reality of that of of him knowing what his son's going through, and obviously being out there, of course, as, as a as a as an owner of the team, and having to be just uh, so many different decisions that are being made there, because ideally you wanted to have Jack Harvey with his second to last run bump ahead of Stingray Rob and then at that point give an opportunity to Graham Rahal to get out there for the final run and ultimately then it's it's three all three across the board for for Rahal Letterman Lanigan Racing that are making that qualifying spot instead of only having instead of leaving one driver behind like they did with Graham but to flip the script of of the, of the sad aspect of that with Rahal the way it was it was emphasized yesterday on the second to last run was that was it for Jack Harvey. There wasn't going to be enough time. They were talking about how you know they, in the lead up to the final ten minutes, you obviously could take an additional lap or two to speed up the cooling process on the engine. And it, it, the way that it was being laid out was that was it. He was not going to have another opportunity to it. In fact, whether you were listening it across the board here locally on the IndyCar Radio Network or if you were watching on TV, you know, at some point there's a commercial break within that. It's like, okay, this is it. Harvey's missed out. And then he comes back out and they roll the dice in a sport again where we talk about it. It is defined by milliseconds often or just fractions of a miles per hour. They're going to go out there and run one more time and just the emotion on everybody's face from from his team to the now like everybody was surprised that the chance was going to be taken one last time, let alone that as it unfolded, lap one, lap two, lap three, and that final lap that Harvey might actually do this and qualify for the race. And that's another driver where his future in IndyCar has been speculated over the last couple of of years and debated about what's next for him. So 
I tip the cap in general to Jack Harvey and his team for pushing the envelope one last. You had nothing else to lose. I was going to say, point. like, might as well. Might as well just go for it, and give it yourself off. a chance. And it paid off in a tremendous way. And I think, again, that is the duality of sports. You know, on one side, you're like ecstatic, the other side, you're, you're, you're hurting. And so I thought uh, it was a unique moment to just see how fun heartbreaking sports can be but also understand why jack went after it i mean why leave a bullet in the chamber yeah go after it you know the worst i mean he was really playing with i guess house money where it's like i have nothing to lose but everything to gain on the other side you know graham's like i i can't control my own destiny so to speak anymore because i gave him my best run and i think this is where you have to kind of look in the mirror and understand okay i did everything that i could does it make it Better, maybe not, but does it make it easier to swallow? Maybe so, because you can't doubt the guy's effort and your preparation and things like that. I think when you get to this level, you'll find very few athletes anywhere who haven't given everything to succeed. And I think that in turn makes it maybe a little bit easier to just be like, okay, well, I did everything that I possibly could. You know, did I run my best race? Maybe not, but I don't have any regrets about me going out there and giving my effort. And you could tell with the way that it was discussed after Qualls had finished up that in terms of what was present for for their cars throughout the session and throughout Qualls, they kind of knew where they were at. Like There wasn't a ton of wiggle room to be able to increase speed that late into the session. And if you're Graham Rahal, like we mentioned, if you go out there and you decide to give it one more go before Harvey's going through all that. If you decide to take a turn, you're giving up your spot at that point. You're foregoing your previous speeds that you set over your four lap average before. You can't chance it if you know that you're about where your car is maxed out on that day. You have to let it play out, and if, if Harvey bumps you, so be it. But yeah, there is there is a feeling of they've done everything that they can at that point in time, so that helps. But at the same time, you and I know it doesn't matter what the sport is, what avenue we're talking about, but it's especially so in the lead-up to the Annapolis 500. They spend more time practicing for this race and the lead-up to the greatest spectacle in racing than they do any other race on the IndyCar series. So you you have an understanding, more so, of course, if you're a veteran than a rookie, but you have an understanding of where your car is at that point and should we be chancing things or should we be sitting back and letting it all play out? It is. I mean, there, there was no other spot for Graham Ray Hall to adjust there because of just the way the day had gone to that point and the fact that, again, you already have a spot secured in the race, you got to let Jack Harvey go earn it at that point. You can't go out there and put yourself in a spot where you put up a, a worse four-lap average, then you've knocked yourself out of the race in your own accord. You know, I mean, it it's a rock and a hard place at that point in time and it has that bittersweet element because it was a teammate. Yeah, I mean, and that's the other part is like, you know, I've never been in that type of situation. Maybe like I guess track and field or something like they're trying to qualify for a race. But I mean, that's that adds another element to it because you can't really be mad at them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you gotta you gotta pat a guy on the back who just uh, you know kind of swapped your spot. So um, there is that element to it, obviously. And I think that that w- is what makes uh, racing unique is because of the margins of it. Like you said, I mean, we're talking about you know seconds here and often less than seconds and then obviously having to have the character to just you know tell your guy you know go win it you know if you don't have your chance for the other i guess emphasis point of the weekend alex below continues his dominance in the month of may able to earn his first career 500 pull it's going nuts it's it's been fascinating to watch four lap average speed of 234.217 miles per hour able to deliver chip ganassi racing a third consecutive indy 500 pull this from indianapolis motor speedway press releases Chip Ganassi Racing, the first team to win three straight Indy polls since Team Penske won four in a row over 88 to 91. So a lot of history set in that regard at their dominance of able to capturing the poll year over year. And then, of course, we mentioned that there was high level drama. There were high level speeds as well. It's the fastest field in the history of the Indianapolis 500 average speed for the 33 car field. 232.184 miles per hour shattered that record that was set just last year of 231.023 miles per hour. 
the whatever you want to call it. If you're not a racing fan, or if you just feel like some of it is 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 is, is overhyped at times. Well, first of all, you're wrong in that regard. And second of all, <laughs> the, the, the the just the speeds and just the high intensity that you're gonna see on quals and the translation into race day. I mean, year over year, you continue to see it deliver, and it, it was high level drama all the way to the very end. But you kind of alluded to, and I heard you gasp when when, when we were discussing it before the show about again just. Alex Pillow, seemingly a man on a mission right now in, in, in trying to do just something that is very rarely seen. Only one other driver is able to be able to do it, and that is after he was capturing the GMR Grand Prix just last week, trying to sweep the month of May, and then he's able to deliver the first step in that regard of winning the pole, his first career pole, continuing the dominance of quals for Chip Ganassi Racing. Of course, that's just one little piece I'm sure in Alex's case, doesn't matter if he's in slot one or in slot three in that starting grid. As long as you're giving yourself the best spot to start race day, all that really matters to him is being able to <laughs> obviously win it all on Sunday and complete this first sweep. Yeah, I mean, I guess he's not uh, taking any pressure off of himself, right? You know, just go be perfect, go go do everything right. But I think what's really cool is, is seeing him kind of establish himself as one of the new faces of this you know being just 26 years old um i'm 27 i don't drive cars that fast or that well <laughs> so to see a guy who's you know been doing it um at a very high level embracing it and then um you know hopefully pulling in even the younger crowd just to show them that um you know if you work hard you dream big you can do some cool things and so we'll see if he can cap it off but it's also one of the other unique things about this sport is like, if he doesn't, you know, you're going to talk about the winner, obviously, because they deserve, you know, that recognition, you know, greatest race. And so uh, you can't not recognize the winner. But if he doesn't do it, do you look at him and say, oh, you came up short? Like, man, the guy's been, he's been balling. So you put the target on your back. And I think that that's uh, one of the most unique things uh, about this is that he's put the target on his back. And if he's able to pull it off, that's uh, pretty spectacular. And if he isn't, how does that motivate him going forward You know, throughout the season? Eddie, I want to bring you in here for just a second because I understand that all jokes aside, you've been chomping at the bit throughout this week and this <laughs> month to, 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 to be a part. And you have been, of course, of the great spectacle to race and lead up to it with all the work that you've been putting in with Trackside, with Beyond the Bricks. Of course, you can hear both those again tonight, 7 o'clock right here on 93.5, 1075 The Fan, 8 o'clock for Beyond the Bricks. And then shortly thereafter, Nuggets, Lakers in progress, Game 4, as the Nuggets look to bring out the broomsticks in L.A. But, Eddie, you will continue to, rightfully so, hype up what this weekend of Qualls is going to be able to deliver your overall takeaways from it, the drama that was there yesterday, Graham Rahal and and, and the Rahal family, unfortunately uh-huh. repeating history in that regard. So many different angles to attack. What jumped out at you the most? This I think you guys have hit the Graham Rahal conversation to a T. Uh, I think, I don't know how well this got discussed yesterday um, on Peacock or on the radio coverage, but like you look at the engines, Honda was dominated by Penske in qualification. Honda had... Uh, I think 11 of the final 15 cars in the field, and Chevy took 10 of the first 15, or, or technically 18, I should say, 11 sure. of the final 18 or whatever the case was. But Chevy just straight up dominated Honda when it came to qualifying. And to also imagine traveling 229, almost 230 miles an hour, and saying it wasn't fast enough to get to the field, <laughs> that's absolutely mind-boggling that's considering tough. the field numbers of the recent year. But, like, kind of figured... Team Chip Ganassi would have a car up front or multiple cars up front. Get the case with Alex Pillow, who should be and probably is the odds-on favorite to win the Indianapolis 500 this weekend. But to me, when you look at the other teams that are represented, I think Aaron McLaren SP, uh, I think they have one of the best groupings of drivers to have going up against uh, Chip Ganassi Racing. You've got Alexander Rossi, Pato Award, uh, Tony Kanaan, and Felix Rosenquist. All four of those guys have raced well in terms of lately here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the race. So it'll be interesting to see who I uh, you know, select come Friday when we make those announcements on some wagers to win the, the greatest spectacle because I was doing some research last week. Renus VK, who's second, starting second, middle row one, he was plus 3,000 last week. And I told Brendan Friday morning, I said, hey, 
This guy is a guy to circle. He hasn't had speed yet. The boost turns up. Next thing you know, he lays a couple big numbers, and now he's second. The odds are plus 1,200. And then you look at another guy, Santino Ferrucci. He was plus 7,500 to win. And then he had an absurd practice run. Uh, and then, of course, tested well in terms of quals. He's now plus 1,000 to win the race on Sunday. I need to know how Santino Ferrucci always has his hair looking so good. Like, it does not matter how long the helmet's been on. It does not matter. Like, it, it is it, it is just truly a sight to see. They kept panning over to him. And like, he's obviously always full of energy, but they, they pan over to him throughout uh, the coverage yesterday. All jokes aside, we will be giving out bets. For James, the pressure is especially on, not because, you know, it, it, we're, we're the only person I believe in this room genuinely where... I would follow into the abyss on a racing bet is Eddie Garrison. Like Eddie, Eddie has a proven track record of handicapping this event. So like for me and James, we're, we're, we're going to go through it. We're going to give you who we think is going to win. But for James, that clock for you is at three o'clock tomorrow. So okay. you really have to take a deep dive and, and make your prediction unless you're going to gonna give us a text, uh, a text to Eddie on Friday for where you're going. I will say we're riding a little bit of momentum here. And here's the momentum that we're riding. We went to the other side of the racing world. That's right. I'm talking ponies. I'm talking thoroughbred horse racing. I'm talking the Preakness. What did we end the show with? We said we were going to place a wager on Mage, but we're going with National Treasure. And National Treasure won the Preakness. So, to this point... In terms of of crown jewels, we didn't get the derby, but we got the Preakness, and then we're going to pass the baton on to Eddie for the Indy 500. So when we give out those bets on Friday, there's some momentum that's turning right now. Don't drop the baton, Eddie. I haven't, and I won't. Uh, (laughs) Just for clarification here, Jimmy says my background. Last two years, I've had three winners in terms of the 500, uh, and they all finished in the top five. So two, and they've won both times. Okay. First, like I said, I'll first, follow into the first abyss. First and second, <laughs> last two years, and then fifth, both years. So I'm usually right there. We're going to have those for you on Friday. We'll have plenty of prognostication in the lead up to the race as well. We're, we're going to have conversation. We won't go through the first list during the full list during this segment. We will have conversation with drivers throughout the, the week. Chris Denary is going to join us at one o'clock, a part of the IndyCar Radio Network. He'll give us his takeaways from just. It, Absolutely incredible qualifying weekend at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and we'll get you set up as the week goes on for the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. Throughout the show today, though, we're also going to take a brief dive into how things went for the fever. We're going to have that next segment, correct? Yep. I'm going to be talking to my buddy, uh, Karina Mustafa who covers the W, the NBA. She wears a lot of hats, you know, a lot of things in her bio, but it'll be fun to dive into that. I was actually at Aaliyah Boston's debut. She looked like a number one pick, and so that's an exciting time for that franchise in the city. We'll go through that. We'll we'll potentially maybe put her on the spot in terms of uh, these 3-0 series of the NBA side of things, if there's there's a pathway to come back anywhere. Uh, For some reason, and it might have been a glitch, but I saw it last night, uh, there's like a... Yeah, there's 60 or 71 percent chance by one of ESPN's ranking systems for the Celtics to still come back and win the series. Again, I don't know if that's been updated or not, but I I'd seen that on Twitter last night, and then that was after it was a 3-0 series lead for Miami. So we'll talk about that. Maybe if there is a path, either way, no, for any of these there teams. Isn't. James kind of already given the cat out of the bag. No, there probably isn't. But is there a path if we were to try to navigate through? No, there still isn't. Okay, that's fine. That's the way things go. Uh, Jimmy Butler is Jimmy Butler. We understand that. Uh, the Lakers appear to be dead to rights. Uh, it's it is a a long list of names being scratched off a note scratched off a notepad rather for Nikola Jokic, and the Nuggets look like a fine tuned machine, and it appears to be a collision course with the Heat and the Nuggets for the Larry O'Brien Trophy. But it's not there yet. They still got to close things out. So we'll dive into that. We'll go over a little bit as well with the fever getting their season started when we return here on the Fan Midday Show. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan.
93.5 The Fan. Back here in the DriveHubler.com studio, I'm James Boyd with Jimmy Cooks and Eddie Garrison. This is 107.5 93.5 The Fan. We have my friend Karina, I'm sorry, Karina Mustafa <laughs> on the phone. I'm sorry. It's, uh, I always got to say your name like twice to make sure I'm right. But uh, she's aware of many hats, covers the NBA for Enjoy Your Basketball, um, Enjoy Basketball, I'm sorry, and among other things, you know, covers a W, just does a lot of things that I think are really cool. And Karina, for you, what was your first impression of Aaliyah Boston? I was there. I saw the uh, flashes of what she could become, and obviously she's a big get here in Indy. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me on, James. Um, and also, I think, you know, they were double teaming her, and then they were also triple teaming her at some point in her debut, which I thought was uh, very funny to see. Obviously, we know Aaliyah is very familiar with contact from playing in college and all that, um, but she kind of got a taste of that in the W now, and I thought she handled it very well. I mean, she had 15 points in both of their first in- weekend. Even against the Liberty, she like blew past John Paul Jones several times. I thought I thought she did really well for her debut in the W. I'm really excited um, for her to lead this Indiana team. I know they lost both times, but they were pretty close against the Connecticut Sun in their first game. So I think it was a lot of positives from Aaliyah's uh, debut weekend. Karina, how helpful or beneficial as Aaliyah starts to get her sea legs, so to speak, within the WNBA. Will her past experience of, of being able to have run with Team USA and, and be playing against some of these high-level stars within the WNBA before she was a part of the league benefit her in the long run? Because that was one of the biggest things as I was seeing her come up is being able to hold your own, not just against international prospects, but also those on Team USA within those scrimmages in the lead-up to, say, the FIBA World Cup last year. Absolutely. I mean, it prepares you for the types of talent and size that you're going to be going up against in the WNBA. I think like those experiences, I've heard a lot of rookies speak very highly about their experiences with with the teams and stuff before they even enter the league. And so it's very obvious that that's going to have an impact on the way that you're comfortable against playing. Like, I mean, it was really hard for Leah to just like start off against Alyssa Thomas as like in her first game like that to me seems so unfair as like a welcome to the league moment in your first game but honestly like all of these experiences leading up to that I thought prepared her really well and she wasn't afraid of the moment and I thought that that really like show shined through so for listeners who don't know who Alyssa Thomas is or don't know much about her she is like the bully of the WNBA <laughs> and so I mean I watched a couple plays where Aaliyah's trying to back her down. She's just not moving, just a stone wall. And so that was a, an exciting matchup to see. But just looking big picture at the team, um, how important do you think it is for them to, I guess, find some continuity and, and find some type of identity after kind of flailing the last few years? And I would imagine a big part of that identity starts not only with Aaliyah, but with Kelsey Mitchell, who to me is an all-star caliber player and just hasn't been giving – maybe the best uh, opportunity to display that to the, to the masses. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I think I was like a bit higher on Indiana going into the season than most people were um, not a great start for them to lose their first two games. But like I said before, like they did keep it pretty close against Connecticut. And I think we saw flashes of like what they could be. Kelsey Mitchell, like, honestly, like I think she needs some more time to get her buckets like she was leading scoring last season she's able to generate looks for herself while also attracting attention when the ball is in her hand like you know she's going to create plays she's always looking around for her teammates um i think she's like the heart and soul of this team and as much as like now the attention is on like Aaliyah boston on melissa smith like all these young players that have come in in the last couple of years kelsey mitchell is still the Indiana Fever. She's still the vet on this team. Um, and so, honestly, like, it's just going to take some time for them to keep gelling together. And uh, it's still a young and exciting team for the Fever. So, Karina, I think one of the things that stood out from yesterday's game was the fact that they're going up against one of these new, quote-unquote, super teams. The Liberty didn't look all that super in their season opener, but my goodness, did they look good yesterday. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on them, the Aces, and just the star power of this league and seeing some of this star power uh, team up. Yeah, it was very interesting because you kind of saw, you saw Aces, Liberty, and then you also saw like the second tier of like Mystic Sun mm-hmm. kind of go off this weekend. And 
I think the Aces definitely stood out, like out, out of everybody else, um, just the way that they completely pummeled the storm. They had like six players in double figures, but I think honestly, like the Liberty, yeah, they were able to get pretty much whatever they wanted against Indiana yesterday, and I think that's going to come with more time as they like gel together and they're able to play together more. But I think like the key to the super teams being successful is going to be a being healthy and being able to play with each other and get a lot of reps in. But I think like a team like the Washington Mystics or the Connecticut Sun who have proven to have like a core that are familiar with each other, like don't like don't uh, forget about them because they're going to be able to do some damage as well if they continue to gel together and build on the experience that they had before because the Mystics looked very, very good this weekend. And then also adding in like Shakira Austin's performance as well. Like she's going to be so, so good for them this year in her second year. We talked a lot about here in the city of Indianapolis and the state as a whole that a number of the different pro franchises are going through varying rebuilds, retools, a lot of time spent in the lottery or towards the top of the draft. We're having a conversation right now of how do the Pacers make that leap next year to finally hopefully have lottery days behind them. You mentioned you were a little bit higher than most on the fever to start the season. Where are they? Obviously, it's a smaller league, but where are they at in that regard? How far away are they from having lottery days behind them? Uh, honestly, like I had them sixth going into the season in my power rankings, so we'll see how that shakes out. I think for me, where I was with the fever, it was like they were either gonna like play really close games and lose a bunch of them, or they were gonna win those really close games. And like right now, they're on the losing side, but we'll see how like it continues to develop as the season moves on. Honestly, I think with like because they got Aaliyah Boston, because they got Alyssa Smith, I think they're like maybe a couple years away from being a very competitive playoff team. And I think we're like closer to that than we are to like still being in the lottery with, uh, with the Indiana fever. Gotcha. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of them in person. I know they're on a road trip right now. They're going to be back at home, I believe, uh, first week of June against the Aces. So we'll see one of those super teams <laughs> up close. Karina, I'll tell you all about it and how it went. And I'm sure you'll be watching. <laughs> but to pivot to the NBA, which you're also familiar with, what are your thoughts on what's happened with the Heat? I mean, I I can see why the Lakers are down against Denver. They're a number one seed. You know, it's hard to beat a number one seed. Nikola Jokic, two-time MVP. But it seems like Jimmy is just ruining the party in Boston or Miami or whatever the case might be. So what has been your reaction to seeing them go from being maybe a quarter away from out of the postseason against the Bulls in the play-in to now being one game away from the NBA Finals? It's so wild because I had the Boston Celtics winning the championship this year, but uh, Jimmy Butler had other plans. And honestly, <laughs> like he he's so powerful. He's got me rooting for the Miami Heat, which like I'm from Toronto. I've been a Raptors fan my whole life. I knew I'd be cheering for the Miami Heat just based on like past history. But Jimmy Butler is such a special talent. And I think one of the biggest uh, things that I've noticed about this Miami Heat team is like what they've been able to do without Tyler Hero because they lost him very very early and I thought that that was going to really hurt them because he's one of their best shooters Um, but they've been able to just be hungry have a lot of ambition I think the fact that trash talking uh, with Jimmy Butler is just making him even better is something that's very impressive because he's like putting money where his mouth is Um, and so I I I I don't know if they're going to sweep the Celtics but if they do it's going to be a it's going to be like a grab your popcorn type of situation for the NBA playoffs and I think it's so good that an eighth seed uh, is doing this right now we were joking to start the show that one of the metrics, and it's sometimes criticized because it uses point differential to base its analytical data on series predictions, is ESPN's BPI. It was kind of getting drugged through the mud last night because it still has Boston with a 72% chance to take the series despite the fact they're in this 3 0 hole. Again, a large part of that, as we've done more research on it, is weighted on point differential. Miami was towards the very bottom of the league, Boston obviously towards the top. I know that you probably removed the biases aside with the Boston prediction, but as you look at that pick on life support right now, and you're not wrong, a lot of people had it. I I did too going into this series. Is there a pathway in your mind for Boston to get back in this thing? I don't know. That's a really big number for (laughs) for it to be confident for them to come back from being down in a 3-0 hole. But I don't know. I feel like 
the thing with the Celtics is like when they look good, they look good, and that means all the pieces have to be working. The ball movement has to be there. But like when you're not getting enough out of your stars, like if you're not getting enough from Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown or you know the supporting cast, I just find it very hard for them to crawl back into this series. I think you need like really big performances like that. Jason Tatum, 51 point performance. Um, I think it was against the 76ers. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to need something like that in order to come back into this series. And I just don't see it happening right now. And I don't think playoff Jimmy Butler is going to let that happen. (laughs) Yeah. You talk about playoff Jimmy Butler. I mean, playoff Jokic has been one of the best players I've ever seen in my life. The guy is efficient. (laughs) He can dominate in a multitude of ways with his rebounding, passing, scoring. And so from that perspective, do you think, because I don't expect the Lakers to come back and win this series, but do you think they get a game, one game, tonight? See, I think they can. Um, I hope they do. I thought they could do it until now, honestly, but now I, they find themselves also down 3-0. and um, So we'll see. It's just it's a little bit hard with the confidence level when you're like going into like a game where you're you don't want to get swept, but also like even if you do get a game and you still end up losing, like is that much better? Who knows? But uh, yeah, it's really hard. Jokic is like he's playing really great basketball when it matters because obviously like the whole MVP discourse between him and Joel Embiid towards the end of the season, where where Embiid was having a better season, but now Jokic is the one that's still in the playoffs. He's playing a lot better. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if the Lakers can uh, get one. I would hope they do, but at this point, it also doesn't really matter that much. So, as a fellow Canadian, can you ask Jamal Murray what he has against the Lakers and why <laughs> he continues to just slaughter them? And, and jokes aside, what has it been like seeing him finally be healthy and have a shot to help them do something they haven't done in franchise history, which is, one, get to the NBA Finals and then win the NBA Finals? Oh, it's been it's been amazing. It's been so great to see. His return was one of my favorite storylines um, of the NBA season. I was so excited for him to come back. Um, I know he's super tired of the bubble narrative. See him performing well again, and like maybe it gives me a reason to claim the Nuggets somehow because he's Canadian. But uh, any any success from him is uh, he's going to make the country proud. Obviously, with his. Uh, involvement with Canada basketball and all that. So I think it's been great to see, not only for the Nuggets, but also just for him personally. Karina, I think the only people who think it's great to see or don't think it's great to see are the Lakers. Um, They're hurting right (laughs) now because of that, man. But thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch through Twitter and things like that, but you continue to do great work, and we'll catch up soon. Thank you so much, guys. All right, that's Karina Mustafa, who covers the WNBA for Enjoy Basketball covers the NBA for Hoops Talk and she does a lot of things wears a lot of different hats every time I talk to her or interact with her Jimmy she has a different hat on her head and so um, it's cool to different kind of see her different sports team hat or different style of hat I mean it just doesn't matter I feel like she does <laughs> TV she does radio she does writing she does WNBA she does tennis she does NBA and so that's really cool but as she said man Jamal Murray seems like he's on a mission and maybe that's one of the lost stories of this postseason that because we've given so much attention to the top dogs, the big names, what have been your thoughts on seeing Jamal Murray really ascend, I think, into being a true, I don't want to say he hasn't been a star, but just a, a guy who's proven that he can be the best player in certain moments to help you win a championship. People can say whatever they want about the bubble, and they still will, and that's fine, but at a time when, again, there was obviously far more serious stuff going on in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic than just basketballs being thrown into a hoop at Disneyland like or Disney World, right? I get it. I understand that. But when you're looking for, 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 for solace in that and the stress of every day, it was nice to be able to turn on a playoff game and, and, and see still stars perform at a high level, at least at least for me. like Sports still was a, a large part of how I got through the pandemic. And that's a long prelude to say, I am thrilled and over the moon that Jamal Murray is finally having a repeat-like performance or repeat-like dominance to what he had in the bubble because so much post-bubble was Devin Booker and the dominance that he showed. They they were going Mm -hmm. stride for stride together throughout the bubble in terms of just the points that were being thrown up. And these are the two future guards of the league. Like this is this is the next iteration of dominance at that position. Like obviously Steph Curry's still there, but it's Devin Booker, it's Jamal Murray. 
And then Murray obviously gets hurt and, and, and tears his ACL and has setbacks. And even at times this season has struggled. And even times this postseason has not had his full A game. He found it this series. Unquestionably, he found it this series. Jokic obviously helped set him up. But you look at when they were talking about the era of big threes shifting to, again, pardon the the cliche phrasing, but this is just how it was labeled, dynamic duos around the NBA. There was kind of that feel of a shift when LeBron went out to the Lakers of, okay, these are no longer big three era. It's now who has the best two options on the floor at any given time. And you start to see an arms race of duos, Kawhi and Paul George. You started to see... Kevin Durant tried to recreate a big three style thing, but it was him and Ben Simmons and Harden. And it was, okay, who has the best two players? It was DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker for a minute. Then they obviously go get KD. But out in Denver, it was Murray and Jokic. And it was, how far can this duo really go? Did the league do anything differently in terms of coverage for the Nuggets? No. They always favor the really high-level star teams. They always favor the big markets. We joked last week about Michael Malone getting overly critical at the media for the way they covered the Nuggets. <laughs> and even though some of it's like, all right, just go and, and coach. Don't worry about the way things are covered. He's right. We, we've we joked about it throughout the entire playoffs. They're a one seed, and they've not gotten the love that they deserve because of the style they play, because of their market they're in. I am thrilled with what Jamal Murray is doing because it proves that the way things were covered this year probably should have been adjusted is point A. And point B of it is they do belong and have proven that they belong in that conversation of who's the best two players on the floor at any given moment in time. It's hard to argue right now in the NBA it's not Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. Yeah, and I think one of the things I've just enjoyed as a fan of the game with Jamal Murray is... The heater he gets on, when he gets hot, it is is one of the best things to see in sports because it's like one goes in, two goes in, and he's just like a flamethrower for the rest of the game. And so maybe that'll be a key for the Lakers tonight is to make sure that he doesn't get off to a scorching hot start because if he sees one or two go in, go in it often means that three, four, five, and six are mm-hmm. going in, and then you're down by you know 10 or 12 to start the game. And so um, we'll see how that goes tonight, but I just wouldn't bet against that guy right now. He looks fantastic. We'll dabble a little bit more into that when we come back. Plus, top of the hour, Chris Denary going to join us. We'll get his thoughts on the lead-up to the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. Also, so many storylines at the PGA Championship. Will Haskett going to join us, and we'll dive back into the NBA playoff huddle at the top of the 2 o'clock hour with Kyle Irving. Kyle Irving is going to join us. <laughs> well, he'll take us through what he's thought to this point of the 3-0 leads in both the Eastern and Western Conference Finals here on the Fan Midday Show.
Alex Blow takes the pole in the fastest field for the Indy 500 in the history of that great event. Jack Harvey, last one in. Graham Rahal, the one on the outside looking in as the dust settled yesterday during qualifications. We're going to expand on that a little bit with Chris Denary of the Pacers radio network and of the IndyCar radio network, even though we'll clarify this as well when we have Chris. He was not out there on assignment yesterday. He will, of course, be a part of the greatest spectacle in racing this weekend, but we'll get his takeaways from the field being set and just, again, what was a chaotic day yesterday. Then, of course, we'll mix in some Pacers there as well. James, we only have a couple minutes here, so this will be a larger conversation that you and I will revisit around 1.30 or so, or a little bit after that uh, as the show unfolds. But NFL starting to come down a little bit harder or reevaluate how they handle players and gambling is the big story today across the NFL. I know there's not a ton of time to fully have a debate about this or a conversation about it right now, but this isn't really a surprise that further safeguards are going to have to be put up when you've opened Pandora's box, even though I I like having gambling in the day-to-day for us sports fans not a surprise that the NFL has continued to have put up more safeguards or at least look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's unique for them because they've partnered with so many betting uh, outlets to the point where it's, it's nonstop. You see it everywhere. And so I find it a little contradictory and to come out and be like, okay, we want you to continue to bet everything, but players, wait a second, we don't want you to do certain things. And so, um, it feels like they kind of are not backtracking, but they're trying to put the safeguards up after, you know, th- the race has already started. And so we'll see um, how much the players pay attention to these things, because I do think that when you look at some of the penalties that have been levied against a guy like Calvin Ridley and other players this season, um, upcoming season, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where even though the league is partnered with all these um, betting outlets that you become naive and you forget you know, how much you have at stake and, you know, do you want to bet your career um, on a bet of a game? And so those are the things that they have to consider. And um, there's definitely a lot of nuance to it. But if I'm a player, it would be very black and white. Like I would make sure I know every single rule. And quite honestly, I probably wouldn't bet just because, you know, you never want to think something or get caught in the weeds for something that you think is uh, okay to do. And it's not. These conversations on the heels of the NFL investigating a second wave of potential violations of its gambling policy uh, that reported by a number of different outlets, including NFL Network and CBS Sports. We'll probably dive into that as we reshuffle things on the schedule today in the 2.30 segment. Uh, Ironically enough, just before we hand out our bets for the day. That's the tragic irony of of the discussion that we're going to have. We're not going to get suspended, (laughs) so there's that. We're not playing, so we got that going (laughs) for us as well. And of course, we'll we'll feed more into the NBA playoffs there too. But around the corner, Chris Denary gets a set as we have the countdown ongoing to the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. The field is set. Reactions from qualifications yesterday. And a look at the NBA playoffs and the Pacers as well with Chris Denary on the Fan Midday Show when we return.
96.5, The Fan. Welcome back to The Fan Midday Show. With Eddie Garrison guiding us throughout the afternoon, I'm Jimmy Cook alongside James Boyd. Happy Monday to you. The countdown is on to the 107th running of the greatest spectacle in racing. Chris Denary, nice enough to take some time with us. You know him as the longtime play-by-play voice on Bally Sports for your Indiana Pacers, also a large portion of IndyCar Radio. Chris, always enjoy talking to you. We mentioned it as we were teasing in. I know that you weren't out there on assignment yesterday for quals, but obviously you, you followed along as you get set up for, for yet another call on the IndyCar Radio Network. I guess I want to start there, Chris, for you. I know that unless the Twitter bio hasn't been updated, you're either about to enter year 18 with the Pacers. Maybe you've already updated it, but 17 years going strong for you there. How many years is this for you now on the IndyCar Radio Network? Yeah, that that is correct. uh, The next fall will be my 18th year as the TV voice of the Pacers. Uh, This will be my 22nd year in turn four and my 24th year overall on the uh, IMS radio network. I started in the late 90s. Uh, the only race that I've missed uh, since I went to turn four was in 2014 uh, when the Pacers were in the Eastern Conference Finals and we did post-game shows on the road. And so I remember being in Miami uh, watching the race. Uh, but I, I, I've been in turn four 2001 to 2013 and from 2015 to uh, – this Sunday. So yeah, it's hard to believe that I've been in turn four for over 20 years. Chris, I know you get this question all the time because people ask me and my answer is, I don't know, but it's just poetry in motion. How do you, Mark James, Jay Query, the entire crew, how do you make it sound so seamless throughout one of the fastest, most electric events that anybody's going to be able to broadcast? Yeah, I get that. I get that question a lot, or I get that comment. People are they, they ask, how, "How do you guys do that?" And you know, I'm very fortunate. I, I just come in uh, with the races in Indianapolis. So uh, you know, Mark and and Nick and Jake and Michael do races throughout the year, and so uh, you know, part of it. And, and I heard an interview that Mark James did yesterday um, with uh, Greg Rakestraw. Um, it, it's all about trust. It really is. It's it's. It's like being a member of a team, and you've got to trust your teammates. And, and so you really have to listen uh, to what your teammate is saying. And so when the lap starts, you know, when the race starts, I'm listening to Nick, and he's got the call, and then he throws it to Michael. And then, of course, I'm really listening intently to Jake uh, because let's say, you know, Alex Palou is in the lead um, going into three and Renas VK is behind him. If there's a pass, uh, then you know you've got you've got to know that you've got to know that now VK's in the lead followed by Polo and so um, you know there's a lot of time spent you know pen to paper um, you know just jotting down quickly you know, who are the top five uh, and then knowing that that could change by the time they get to you but uh, we'll we'll do a, a rehearsal if you will on Friday uh, we'll be up uh, in all of our spots uh, for carburation day. And for me, that's really important. I mean, I've been studying the cars, been watching the cars, uh, doing all those kinds of things. You know, you, you really can't see the number of the cars. you got to really hone in on colors and those types of things. So uh, it's something I look forward to every year. I mean, there are people throughout the country, you know, Monday or Tuesday, I'll have text messages, emails from other NBA folk, uh, from friends of mine, you know, college friends, high school friends that, maybe don't even live in Indianapolis, but their tradition is listening to the Indianapolis 500 on radio. So uh, looking forward to it this Sunday. Chris, long time no see, by the way. Um, Glad to see you're still rocking out with the Pacers over there. (laughs) Enjoy uh, listening to you rather than, I guess, seeing you at every game this past season. But um, the one thing you talked about was working with your teammates. We had some teammate um, things happen towards the back end of, you know, the qualifying. Um, And so what did you think of the way – uh, Graham Rahal handled himself after having Jack Harvey um, bump him, you know, out of contention for the Indy 500. I mean, a hundred percent class. I mean, just the way that, that Graham handled that. I mean, you know, you're driving for your dad and uh, your, your name is on, on the team and you're not going to be in the biggest race in the world. Um, it had to be gut wrenching, but the way he handled it, uh, the way he answered all the questions, uh, the emotion that he showed, 
Um, I, I mean, you can't help but as as he moves on in his career, you know, root for the guy. Um, so, uh, but you have to give a lot of credit to Ray Hall, Lanigan, Letterman Racing, and, and what they did is they 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 gave Jack Harvey the opportunity, and he went out the first time and didn't do it. And I don't think any of us. Uh, you know, wherever you were listening, if you were out there, if you're listening on radio, watching on television, um, you know, David Hamilton did not think that Jack Harvey would have enough speed to get there. And so you got to give him a lot of credit because um, those the, his third and fourth laps uh, were incredible because all of those laps decline, you know, first to second, but him, him able to hold on in laps three and four and get the job done, I mean, simply amazing. We were trying to find a proper comparison, Chris, and maybe there's not one, but as they're panning over and showing Graham Rahal in the cockpit of his car, just watching all this unfold, but there is a sense of helpless, helplessness there and the human element of things because there's nothing he can do. Like, like, it's his teammate. There's a bittersweet moment there, but, like, there's not going to be time for another run by the time Jack Harvey takes one final go at it. And, and that was shocking to me enough because, like you mentioned, the way they put it on display after his second-to-last run made it seem like he wasn't going to have enough time and, and getting the engine cooled down and ready to go for the second or the, the final run that he got. When you're looking at sports and, and all the great events you've covered, is there anything close to it in terms of what's going through both the minds of Graham Ray Hall, of Bobby Ray Hall, and the entire racing team, and of Jack Harvey in a moment like Bump Day? No, I don't think so. From the standpoint that if you're if you're Graham Ray Hall, there's nothing you can do. I mean, if you're out, let, let's say it's a basketball game. Um, you know, James covered the Pacers uh, for the Star for a number of years, and you know now with the Athletic and the Colts. But you know, think about a, a last second shot or a, a hail mary touchdown pass. The other team is out there defending or trying to stop that team, and so they have some skin in the game, right? Graham Rahal had no opportunity. He just had to sit there like everybody else and watch. I mean, he, he, he didn't have the luxury of being out on the track able to do anything. So I, I don't know if there is anything like that. The only thing that I could, could say would be, would be like a golf tournament, okay? The, the, you know, the, the player is coming down the 18th hole. Um, somebody's already in the clubhouse and either has the lead or is tied and just has to watch you know, the, his, his or her fellow competitor do something on the 18th hole. That's about the only thing I could compare it to because it seems like in any other competition, the other, you know, the other team that's trying to score, there's a, the, the other team is trying to defend, and they have a chance to make a stop. So, yeah, just, just I, I don't know if we've ever seen any. You know, we, we've seen it before, and that's the great thing about bumping. And even though there was only a field of 34 fighting for 33 spots, it still gave – uh, yesterday, something that we have not seen in a while. So, Chris, you talked about you know uh, being at the mercy of another person, other event, pivoting to the Pacers. Three of the first four lotto numbers were to win <laughs> the thing, and then you're at the mercy of the ping pong balls and maybe not having to bounce the right way. Um, what was your reaction to that? Maybe coming so close to having that, you know. Uh, very coveted number one pick, but also realizing that in all seriousness, they didn't drop, which is a good thing. And they're in position to add another young piece to this core. Yeah. I think, you know, the good news is they didn't drop, uh, you know, they, they're number seven. Um, and the fact that uh, their second round draft pick is 32 and didn't drop to 50, you know, that's a positive. Uh, I was emceeing an event that night for the Pacers and, you know, all the fans were there and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, 14, 13, 12, they, they went down and you're thinking, hey, maybe there's a chance here. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think we all knew the percentages did not weigh in the Pacers' favor. But but I think they have, as Kevin Pritchard has said, I use this, I use this word after he's used the word, <laughs> uh, the Pacers have a lot of optionality, right? They, they, they go into this draft with three first-round draft picks, uh, the second pick of the second round, and another pick uh, in the 50s. Uh, I think it's a pretty a pretty deep draft. I mean, clearly Wimba Yama and Scoot Henderson, um, you know, are at the top. 
and, you know, it, it, there's a maybe there's a drop off between three and and you know ten, but I think you can get a pretty good player at seven. Uh, I, I think Kevin Pritchard and Chad Buchanan have said, look, we don't anticipate bringing five rookies onto this roster. Uh, they only have three open roster spots, uh, three free agents and George Hill, uh, James Johnson, and O'Shea Brissett. Uh, I think they have an opportunity to use those draft picks for trades. Uh, I've said this. I think Tyrese Halliburton is a wonderful leader, and I think he is somebody that not just his teammates with the Pacers want to play with. I think there are players across the league that would want to play with Tyrese. So I think the Pacers are in a good position. I think they can be flexible. I think they'll, there are a number of teams that don't have first-round picks that are looking to get into the draft. So I think the Pacers have a lot of really good options, and you know, I'm sure that if, if you were fortunate enough to get to the Ascension St. Vincent Center and look at their whiteboard, um, it probably <laughs> has – about 10 to 12 or 15 different scenarios with what they could do. And I think they're excited about that. That was going to be my next question. You touched on it a little bit there, but how much do you think Tyrese Halliburton could change the landscape of this team, not only because of the way he plays, but the way he uplifts others. And we've seen Miles Turner have a career year this past season because of Tyrese just finding ways to put him in situations to succeed, and how much do you think that'll entice other players to say, hey, if I just go over here and, and I run the floor, I'll get in eight points a night playing with this guy? Oh, no question. I mean, you know, give a lot of credit to the coaching staff, uh, you know, Rick Carlisle and his staff, and, and Tyrese. They unlocked Miles Turner. There's no question about that. And, and put him in great positions to be successful. Uh, his offensive numbers were the best that, that we have seen in his eight years. And so I agree with that. I, I, I think Tyrese is a more than willing passer. He senses that if he needs to take over offensively, he can, but he will also work on getting his teammates uh, the best shots possible. So I, I think when you have somebody like that, he's only 22 years old, he's going into his fourth year, so his final year of his rookie contract, I mean, he's going to be a pacer for a long time, and I, I think that bodes well for the franchise. Chris, when you look at the areas of need for the Pacers and you look at the treasure trove of, of first-round picks that they have just in, in this year's draft, and obviously you mentioned picking 32 in the second round, you can tell within the organization they feel like they're close to turning a corner, that they, they, they want to be, ideally like any team that's in the lottery, out of it next year. They want to be vying for a play-in spot or, or vying for a playoff spot. When you look at the strides they made this year and the options available, then the optionality, like you mentioned that Kevin Pritchard said, with this coming draft and the rest of this offseason, how critical, how monumental is this specific offseason for the Pacers franchise with where they want to go with this core? Well, I think it's very important. Uh, I, I, they made a lot of progress this year. I mean, some people would say, okay, they only won 35 games, but it was 10 more than last year. And they did it. Uh, it, it look, look back at the first half of the year. They were 23-18 and 18 at the halfway point. And I remember going to New York, and this was going to be a huge game at Madison Square Garden because it was a Knicks team that was, you know, I think they had 21 or 22 wins. And then Tyrese Halliburton gets hurt, and he misses the next 10 games, and the Pacers go 1-9. and nine, And that pretty much sort of sealed the deal, uh, you know, in the Pacers' season as far as making even the play-in or the playoffs because, you know, they're a little bit in a scramble mode. So uh, this is a franchise that wants to get back to where they feel they belong. And if you look over, e- even though they've not – been in the playoffs the last three or so years and have not won a playoff series till uh, since 2014. I mean, look back since uh, 2000, the last 25 years, they're in the top five or six or seven as far as teams that have made the most um, conference finals appearances, and that number would be a little bit higher in the East. I think it's Boston, Miami, and I think the Pacers are right there. And so – they really feel like they have the pieces in place to, you know, to have the core and the base, and now you got to keep adding to that. And, uh, you know, a lot of players have been in the building the last couple of weeks working out, the young guys, uh, and that's always a good sign. We saw that last year. And, you know, this is a, this is a franchise that next 
late April, early May, does not want to be on the sidelines. They want to be in the postseason. And I've said this, that there is no better time um, in Indianapolis than racers and pacers. I mean, I look back <laughs> oh, yeah. at, at I look back at 2012, 13, and 14 recently. I mean, you can go farther back into the 90s and uh, the early 2000s with Reggie. But I, I just want to go back to, to when I was doing games. You know, uh, uh, 12, 13, and 14, those three series with the Miami Heat um, and Racers Pacers uh, during May is just fantastic. And, and, you know, you throw in, I was the longtime voice of the Indiana Fear, the WNBA team, and, and they start in, in May. So that's what Pacer Sports and Entertainment wants to get back to mm-hmm. is uh, having those opportunities uh, in April and May to, uh, you know, fill Gamebridge Fieldhouse and, and, and bring back those days of the past. Chris, how cool was it to see Rick Carlisle challenge Benedict Matherin the way that he did throughout the season? Obviously, he had an incredible start and really an overall great rookie season, but to hold him to that standard and to see Matherin not shy away from that and accept that and even want more of it. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the thing that Rick said early in the year is that, you know, Benedict last summer uh, came up to Rick and said, look, I want you to coach me hard. I need you. I want you to challenge me. I, w- I want to be the best that I can be. And, you know, they did that throughout the year. I mean, there were there were a few times uh, probably I'm going to say in the six, game 60 to 70 where they sat him down a few times because they didn't feel like he was doing what 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 Benedict wanted to do or what the coaching staff and it didn't affect him from the standpoint that he sulked or he moped nope he just went out and worked harder and uh, I thought he had a really really good year I mean he was first team all rookie uh, averaged better than 16 points per game I mean this is a this is a young man that has a chance to be really really special um, you know how who do you compare him to I mean if you know, some people have said with his demeanor and his work ethic, I mean, Jimmy Butler, right? And what we're seeing Jimmy Butler do in the playoffs right now. But uh, there's there's no question that he has a chance to be a very, very special player. And uh, I know that there are many off days for Benedict Matherin in the off season, <laughs> if, if any. If any. I mean, I can just tell you that, um, you know, one of the great things about being back on the road this year, and again, we didn't travel for two years after COVID, was just being on the bus um, after games. And, I mean, Benedict would be – I mean, he'd have his phone out. He was watching highlights. I mean, he was watching highlights of 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 the game. Um, and this is, you know, 45 minutes after the game. So, he not, not that there are other guys that don't want to be good because they do, but this guy has a special mindset and has a chance to be really good. Chris, I want to shift back to the Speedway for just a second. Chris Denary joining us here on the Fan Midday Show, TV voice of your Indiana Pacers, as well as a part of the IndyCar Radio Network, will be out at the Speedway covering the 107th running of the Indianapolis 500. You'll hear him on these very airways, as well as across the IndyCar Radio Network. We talk about how hard it is to be able to dominate the month of May, and obviously Simon Passion is the lone example of being able to sweep the GMR Grand Prix and then go out and actually win the 500. That's now on Alex Pillow's radar completely. It was after he won last weekend, and now able to add a, a pole victory to that as well over Qualls. Your takeaways on what this young man is doing and just his outlook as he gets ready for these final couple days preparing for the greatest spectacle in racing. Well, he's with a great team. I mean, we all know that. Um, he's got a good mentor, uh, you know, Scott Dixon. And, uh, you know, the one thing about what's going to happen on Sunday, you got to have a lot of luck. you got to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, how many times have we, you know, we, we thought about uh, favorites and, you know, they get caught up in an incident or, you know, speed on pit road or, or any of those things that can have you out of the race. So, but he's a special talent. There's no question about that. And, you know, trying to do something that, you know, is very rare, and that's sweep the month of May. Uh, but uh, it's a long race. I mean, I can, t- I can tell you from sitting up in turn four, uh, it's a long, long race. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see what the conditions are. It looks to be, you know, that it's going to be warm but not, not super hot. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he's, a, he's a, fe- a special talent. There's no question. And, you know, Will Power said this the other day in an interview on the IMS radio 
that he thinks it's as deep a field as we've ever seen uh, at the Indianapolis 500. I mean, there are so many talented drivers, uh, so many young drivers that are up and coming. So uh, Polo is definitely one of those. Is it still fascinating to you 20 plus years into this that you mention it? It's it is a, a perfect mixture of how to win this race. A lot of it is luck. A lot of it is the engineers. A lot of it, of course, is the drivers. But it has to be a perfect mixture of all that, does it not, to be able to walk away victorious on Sunday? I mean, he, he, there's no written way to do it. You can set yourself up for better success based on quals and all that. But it really all does come down to how the rest of the chips fall over the course of that race. Yeah, I mean, if you have a bad pit stop, I mean, if if you stall in the pits, if, you know, they, they struggle getting a tire on. I mean, there are just so many things that, that go into uh, the opportunity to win, you know, a 500-mile race. I mean, if this was a sprint, you know, and it, you know, it was a 10-lap or a 20-lap feature, it, it'd be maybe a little bit easier to call, but it's not. And, and that's what makes it, that's what makes it so cool. I mean, you know, for me, what I enjoy is just every bit of the day, um, you know, being out there in turn four, um, you know, fortunately we now have a big, you know, we've had a big screen out there for a number of years, but, you know, just to be out there amongst all the people, so many of the fans that sit in front of me have been there for the 20 years that I've been there. So it's almost like, you know, you, you show up and, and there's some of the people that you recognize year after year after year. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's I, I consider myself very lucky to uh, continue to be able to do this. Again, I work with a great group that, you know, does it week in and week out on the IndyCar Radio Network. And I'm just thrilled that I'm, I'm able to, to continue on in turn four and, and looking forward to it again on Sunday. Last one from me, Chris. What has it been like to see the sport grow and get to a place now where, you know, this is the fastest 33 car field that you all have had? And I mean, what has that been like to just see it evolve, change, shift, and now be in a space where you're like, man, you know, what might have, you know, been good enough four or five years ago isn't really what's um, good enough now? Yeah, and the faster they go, the quicker we have to talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we only have. Uh, you know, maybe five to 10 seconds uh, to, to say what we see. So, you know, as the cars go faster, uh, it makes it probably more incredibly difficult for us because you have uh, less time uh, to, to get your thoughts out. And as I've said, you know, of the 200 laps, we won't, we won't call every, every lap, but I'm going to say we're going to do 75 to 80 percent of them because at some point Mark James will go down to the pits or he and Davey Hamilton will talk. And, and what I've always said is you really have to be on your A game. Yeah, you may make a mistake here or there, but you better make a mistake on lap 41. You better not make a mistake on lap 198 or 199 or, 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 or 200. So, um, but I like it. I mean, it's, it's just like an athlete has to deal with the pressure of the moment. I feel like we as broadcasters have to deal with the pressure of the moment. Um, you know, I don't know how many people will be listening. I mean, it'll, I'm sure throughout the country, around the world, it's millions. And so you have that many people listening to you. And so uh, there, there's a sense of pressure that, that we have as well uh, to make sure we have the call right. Well, I, I wish you all the best in terms of your speed reading exercises between now and then. <laughs> um, as, as entertaining as that would be for me and James, it's a shame we don't get to see a, a, a qualification speed run with you, uh, Mark, and, and Jake, and, and the entire crew trying to go full speed at, uh, I don't know what it would be at that point, uh, 70 or 80 words per minute. Let's just roll through it with a high-powered broadcaster exercise. But all jokes aside, Chris, it, it's a you mention it, even if you don't have the numbers off the top of your head, it's an incredible tradition being able to listen to the race here I, I know i'll be doing that i'm not going to be out there at the track this year for the race but i will have it wherever i am for memorial day weekend uh, you and the entire crew there are a tradition for so many people that listen across the state and across the world really of the indycar radio network and i, I can't wait for sunday i know you guys are going to do a fantastic job as always well thank you very much i mean i think back to when i was a kid uh, i i was uh, born in the dayton ohio area and lived in southwestern ohio for I think the first 11 or 12 years of my life before we moved to Indiana. 
And I just remember being in the backyard uh, playing hot box or wiffle ball. And we'd have the, the radio on on the patio and we'd be listening to the Indianapolis 500 because my dad uh, was an Indianapolis native. And so for me now, you know, again, 50 years later, uh, to still be a part of it and calling the race on radio, it's pretty special. That That is very special indeed. And we enjoy listening to every second of it and continuing that tradition for the generations to come. Chris, thank you again. I know it's a very busy week for you, but always appreciate when you're able to make some time for us. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, James. Thank you, Eddie. That's Chris Denary. 17 years in the books as the Pacers TV broadcaster for Bally Sports. You're 18 coming up for him and yet another year for IndyCar Radio with the greatest spectacle in racing this weekend. Of course, we'll have you locked in across the board with the race day coverage right here on the fan. Not going to want to miss that. If it's not already, you're missing the boat. Make sure you have that <laughs> a part of your entire day from dawn until dusk here on the fan. Literally starts at 5 a.m. with Jamie and Tony Katz. Doesn't get any better. I won't be starting at five a.m. I won't. I won't. I won't either. <laughs> but you know what? I'm gonna. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have a a radio on somewhere within the house, <laughs> probably outside. But but I'll have it on so that we're still uh, carrying the listenership and getting go. the day off right. Uh, start the alarm clock that way. If you're not getting up at five a.m., have, have it preset to one hundred seven five. The fan, uh, whatever it is on your iHeart Radio app or through your Alexa device, whatever the case may be, that could be your custom alarm on Sunday, James. <laughs> I mean, it could be. Who, who knows? Um, but it should be a lot of fun, obviously. And I think one of the things that Chris touched on which is always cool for me is like when you see and maybe he's been around long enough where you see the kid grow up and then bring their kid yeah. and so um, I expect it to continue I mean 107 years is obviously a long time to do anything and to see it uh, get to this stage where it's still so impactful um, so much enthusiasm and then so much new life at least in this year's uh, field that makes it you know gives another chapter in this book whether you're there in person or whether you're listening on the radio here it's such an important part of so much of the culture of this city, it, everybody has a story like that, like Chris does, of of playing in the backyard or maybe sitting poolside grilling out uh, on Memorial Day weekend. Everybody has those type of stories and avenues if you're not lucky enough to be able to be at the Speedway for the Great Spec One Racing. You're listening to it here, and they do such a tremendous job. I know Chris says he gets it all the time, but they do. They get questions. I ask it every year, man. How do they make it sound so seamless and just so perfect but they're able to do that and you're going to want to be a part of it wherever you listen but especially here on 935 107.5 the fan on sunday we're going to step away from racing for a second and head to old oak hill for the pga championship we'll recap the win some surprising storylines as well brooks kepka emerges victorious what does it mean for the last two majors on the calendar we'll go over that with will haskett of the pga tour radio network around the corner on the fan midday show
fan. In the drivehumor.com studios, this is the Fan Midday Show. Jimmy Cook, James Boyd, Eddie Garrison behind the ones and twos. Joining us now, he is a key cog in the machine that is the PGA Tour Radio Network. I don't have his actual billables to fully make this a ring announcer like introduction, but it's Will. It's Will Haskin with us today here on the Fan Midday Show. <laughs> Will nine under goes Brooks Kafka third time. He captures the Wanamaker Trophy. From a viewership standpoint, it felt like at times that maybe he might slip up here and there, but eventually closes strong. Uh, from the broadcast standpoint, was it ever really in doubt for you on the final day? Uh, no, I mean, I was doing featured groups this past week on ESPN Plus, and I had Scotty Scheffler and Justin Rose yesterday, and so we were certainly invested in this idea, like, could Scotty Scheffler make a charge and, and run down Kepka, and he did shoot 65, but, you know, he he's... He had his approach at an 18. He's technically he was four shots back at that very moment. And I think if it weren't for the amazing story of Michael Block, the <laughs> PGA professional from California, who just sort of created this buzz and this energy over the last hour, it would have been a major where there was a guy leading by four with two holes to go, which just doesn't kind of bang the same, you know, if that makes sense. And so I think that there was it was odd in that sense because there was a lot of energy around the golf course for something that didn't have to do with the winner. But to answer the broader question, you know, Brooks birdies three in a row, two through four, and just kind of felt like it was, I mean, even though he made a couple of bogeys and Victor Hovland was right there, he never gave up the lead. And until somebody could really prove that they were going to come all the way to the top and pass him or, you know, sort of punch him in the mouth of the moment. And Scheffler tried. I mean, he almost spun in a wedge on 13 and he hit the flag stick with a bunker shot on 14. And if one of those drops and that place goes absolutely insane, then maybe we would have seen a little something there, but no, it kind of felt inevitable in a lot of senses yesterday for Brooks. And then it ended up being, but we had to kind of wait for the, the Michael block smoke to clear for there to be this sort of walk up 18. Like, Oh yeah. And here comes Brooks to win the tournament. <laughs> well, you touched on it there. I'm not a huge golf guy. I usually keep up with who wins, you know, some of the majors and things like that, but Michael block, he was all over my timeline yesterday. I'm like, wait a second. He's not winning this thing, is he? And so I see that he had the hole in one, his reaction. Um, what do you think that does just for the sport when you have those moments where, you know, if you're, you know, I don't know, an amateur golfer or something like that, you kind of see yourself in a guy like him? Yeah, I mean, he's a, you know, he's a professional. He's won 45 professional tournaments in the Southern California section. So it's no different than – you know, the head pro at the Brickyard or, you know, um, the head pro at Crooked Stick, you know, being able to compete in this tournament. They're really, really stinking good golfers. And mm-hmm. Michael Blackson, a really good professional golfer. He's made five PGA championships and qualified for two U.S. Opens. So this was his seventh major that he had played in by going through the, the various qualification channels. I think within the industry and within the business and someone who was a, a club professional for two years out of college here in Indianapolis, I think many of us sort of know what those guys are capable of and the best players do. It's just that they also have day jobs, you know, doing lessons and, you know, regripping clubs and running junior camps and all the things that sort of endear them to sort of this every man type of thing. And so I think that the story was more, let's shine a light on these, these, pro, these you know, club professionals on a really hard golf course this week. I thought it was going to be really difficult for anybody to make the cut. He was the only one out of the 20 to make the cut and then kind of contends when it's all said and done and has all of these incredible storybook moments along with it. Uh, I think this is an isolated situation. Like, do I expect Michael Block to win a PGA Tour event in his exemptions? No. Do I expect him to win, you know, to do this again in a PGA Championship? No. But it was a perfect person to sort of highlight what the PGA of America is, which is different than the PGA Tour, which most golf fans don't actually understand the differentiator here that the PGA of America represents all professional golf members, which is for predominantly the guys behind the counter or on the range at your local club. And Michael Block is one of those guys and one of the 20 that plays in their ultimate championship for professional golfers. And so I think that was the big part of it. But um, it just shows that there's always a guy or gal out there, even at the highest levels of golf, that can have that one magical moment with the professionals of the very best. And that is always what makes this sport special and why it, 
I think it's not good to try and say, hey, let's just make sure the, the top 20 guys in the world are only playing against one another. Do the fans want that? Sure. But then what, what we miss out is on something like yesterday, which was truly magical to watch what happened with Block over the entire weekend. Obviously, the hole-in-one is more impressive of the two of these, but when you mention the fact that you're you're about to have Brooks Kepsa capture his third Wanamaker trophy, and that's really what the, the, the main dressing is for all the support and the block chance and, and everything else throughout that day, he still needed that wild par save at the end to be able yeah. to have a share of 15th place and earn a ticket into the 106th edition next season. Yeah, no doubt. And I think Jim Nance was probably a little bit too hyperbolic on the air, saying he was like the greatest up and down ever. But given the circumstances, for him, it was pretty special. And let's and he said afterwards, if he knew that he had to get it up and down and stay in the top 15, which he didn't really think about, he was just kind of playing golf and just riding this you know, wave of emotion. He said, there's no way I get that up and down. If all of a sudden someone applies the pressure and I realize that I have to make par here to get this next shot and to be back in this championship the following year. So yeah, the hole in one is always the moment, but I think the skill and the, I guess, the stick to the fight that he had sort of showcased through there. I'm not saying that hitting a hole in one is fluky, but he hit a really good golf shot and it just happened to go in the hole on the way down, right? And the skill that it took for him to get that shot and to hit that shot, that flop shot up and down, and then drill the putt on top of it just sort of shows what he was made out of the entire week. And, and then do it alongside Rory McIlroy, who was just, you know, so effervescent with him, you know, every time there was a moment, which was just kind of a, a cool sort of element as you have the face of golf, you know, playing with this guy who's the face of the club professionals that week. That made it even more special. So, look, in 10 years, are we going to remember this as the Michael Block PGA? No, probably not. It's going to be Brooks Kepka's third PGA championship. But at least on this Monday, Block is stealing a lot of the headlines. So for Brooks, this was his, you know, first major win in four years. What do you think it takes mentally to kind of set the pace out there and hold on as we've talked about? Well, that's what Brooks Koepka has always been able to do until he hit this little career swoon due to injury over the last couple of years. The reason why Brooks was so good at winning majors is that he had this competitive drive, and he said that he was just more equipped than other guys to deal with sort of the pressure and the difficulty of the shots it takes to win on really, really hard major championship venues. And this is, he's a big game hunter when it comes to these tournaments. I mean, when it's sort of regular tournaments, it's like, oh, okay, like, do I really want to put forth the effort that I need to do this? But he just knows the shots to hit. He can overpower golf courses. He can really will the ball into the hole more so than almost any of his peers. And the only thing that really had knocked him off of the pedestal of being the best major player of his generation was injuries. And a year ago at this time, he was sort of questioning whether or not he was ever going to be able to have the game to do it again. I think the injuries have just sort of zapped him of this confidence, and it's a big reason why he jumped from the PGA Tour and took the money to go play on the Live Golf Tour because he just didn't really know if he was going to have it. And then he's healthy again this year, and we've seen it in the two major championships that you know, big game Brooks is back. And he talked about that, and I think we've seen his maturation so much in the last 12 months, and he was he's sort of open and spilling his soul in the Netflix documentary that a lot of people have watched and we sort of saw like what he was going through. And so it was, it was a much more endearing Brooks Kepka yesterday than the first four majors that he won when he was just kind of nonchalantly like, look, yeah, I'm, you know, golf's kind of not my thing, but I'm just better than these guys. I'm just <laughs> tougher. And, you know, I wish I was a baseball player, but I'm a golfer. I'm just going to show these guys how it, it takes. And then this one was significantly more emotional. I think Brooks won a lot of people, a lot of people who weren't Brooks Kepka fans. I think he won over this week just because, you could see how, what it meant for him to make that climb all the way back. Because a year ago at this time, he was like, I can't compete with the Scotty Schefflers and John Roms of the world. And this week, you stared him down and beat him. Will Haskin of the PGA Tour Radio Network taking some time with us here on The Fan. Will, James and I were discussing this before we went on the air, but is there at all a sense of, of, of awkwardness or, or uncomfortability at all about Brooks being a live golfer and winning this event? I think only if you want to make that the narrative. Brooks did a really good job of distancing himself from that this week. He was Brooks Kepka playing in a major championship. A lot of the other live guys that were there were dressed, some of them head to toe in their team live gear with some of their, you know, the range goats or the high flyers or whatever their weird team names are <laughs> on live. And Brooks didn't have any of that. He didn't have any of the branding. I, didn't, I can't even remember what team name he is, like Team Smash maybe. Like there was no Smash gear 
on Brooks Kepka this week. It was he made this a point even afterwards. People were like, well, "What does this do for Liv?" And he, you know, he said a couple of the little talking points just kind of out of one side of his mouth, and then said, "No, this is about me. This is about me coming and winning a major championship." Which, look, is it a huge deal for Liv that one of their guys won a major? Absolutely, and they're going to market the hell out of it sure. over the next couple of days, especially going into a tournament. Is was there anybody on Live that was least likely to then be like, "Yay, Rod Live"? It was Brooks. But I mean, if you believe a lot of the chatter and the behind the scenes stuff, I don't. I think he would go back to the PGA Tour if he wasn't in a three year contract. That's me speculating, but there's a lot of smoke around what, what that rumor happens to be right now around him. It is what it is. We have two tours. These guys are only going to play together four times a year. Um, but yeah, every every good piece of news that happens for Live is great for the Live Golf Tour right now, and him winning was a really big deal. But it's way different than if Patrick Reed had won, or even if Bryson DeChambeau had won, because I think you would have heard a, a press conference afterwards or a guy there that would have been championing how amazing Live was. Instead, it was Brooks being like, "No, this was I did this for me. Like I beat all these people, and I'm the PGA champion again, and celebrate my work, not where I come from." You talked about Scotty Scheffler obviously finishing runner-up. Can you – it wasn't a win, but can you speak to the level he's been at, you know, for the last year or so and, and just what he's been doing to put pressure on the rest of the field? Yeah, it's 13th straight top 12 finish for him. It's the longest streak anybody's had since Tiger did it, I want to say, like 15 years ago or so. And his he just does everything so well. He had a terrible round on Saturday in the rain. Just got off to a bad start and never really developed enough momentum to just at least save the round enough to then be a, a full threat down the stretch yesterday. But, I mean, he sure tried. I mean, he tied the low round of the tournament. He had a, a bogey-free round in round one. I mean, he did some spectacular things this week. He just happened to have the one bad day. And Brooks kept got a terrible first round, too. And he only hit six of 18 greens, but managed to scramble to a 72. And a lot of times in these majors, it's not necessarily what you do really, really well. It's what, how can you make your worst moment not as bad from a scoring standpoint? How can you squeeze out the best score possible when things don't go very well for a six-hole or nine-hole stretch? And that was what kind of got Scotty Scheffler this week. Uh, he, it, he's one of those players where it's really hard to point to something that he does phenomenally well. He doesn't make a lot of bogeys. He hits it a mile. He's the most anonymous and personable and approachable superstar number one golfer. Like, he's just sort of a ho-hum guy. Um, and so I think a lot of that kind of just takes away from us putting him on a massive pedestal compared to other guys who either have sort of that aura to them or have a, a superstar trait or quality about their game. But, I mean, he just keeps racking up top five finishes, and I wouldn't be surprised if he wins one of the final two majors this season. It's not the best of fits, I think. I think the first two majors of the year were probably going to be the best fits for Scotty Scheffler, but if he keeps playing at this level, he's going to be a real threat in L.A. in a couple of weeks. Well, last question for you. Obviously, there's plenty of events between now and then, but when you look at the performances that you saw at Oak Hill over the weekend and the lead-up and the build-up to the U.S. Open obviously taking place June 15th, so here in just about three or four weeks. What are the biggest things that you're monitoring and tracking between now and then with the upcoming events on tour? Yeah, I mean, we have so many good tournaments, and it's in a short window of time. I mean, the Live guys are right back at it this week, which I found kind of interesting. It would be kind of curious to see what kind of energy there is in Washington, D.C. for that tournament, while at the same time the PGA Tour is at Colonial and Fort Worth, which is a legendary tournament. And then next week, I'll be in Dublin, um, in Columbus for the Memorial, which is one of the best golf tournaments in the world each and every year. So there's a lot of opportunities to kind of see you know, who gains a little bit of momentum. But then we get a, a West Coast major on you know Father's Day, which is always so fun because we get, we get primetime Sunday night golf. And I think we're just kind of – I think there's going to be maybe some cool things for golf fans to cheer about. But, again, like I said, the sad thing is that we're not going to see Brooks Kepka and Scotty Scheffler and John Hoff and Bryson Ambo and Dustin Johnson and Vince Hovland all compete against each other in the same tournament until we get to L.A., and so while I could sit here and talk for 10 minutes about how all the tournaments between now and then are awesome and they're on great venues and they have amazing charitable contributions and you're going to see some of these star players in them. The fact of the matter is we're, you know, LA Country Club is only a month away and we're going to see, a, I think, a really, really cool U.S. Open on a kind of funky and tricky layout out there in LA. So yeah, there's some good stuff coming, but I think it's more just tracking who's playing well, you know, who rises to the top and wins some of these events because, 
you know, there's a momentum coming off of this major. A lot of these guys are exhausted. It was a really long week on a really hard golf course, and we'll see how they kind of bounce back in these weeks and rest and prepare and who wins to just kind of build that next level of momentum. But right now we've got a really good thing going where, you know, there's a handful of top guys in the sport that all seem to be there when it's all said and done. Scheffler, now Kepka back again, John Rahm, Rory. You know, I'd, be, I'd be hard-pressed for me to see somebody outside of, you know, the top ten players in the world add in Kepka to that finding a way to win again when the U.S. Open tees off in a month. Will Haskett with us from the PGA Tour Radio Network. Always nice to get your insights, Will, and fear not. Uh, when we see you here a little bit in studio later this week, I will have plenty of flags ready to go for you uh, for all of our banter in the lead-up to the greatest spectacle in racing. Are you saving all the Washington Commanders tampering content until I come in on Wednesday? Or are we just going to wait until then to talk this? I, I was thinking that we could, we could, we could bookend that with your predictions, win loss wise, for the Colts schedule. I was thinking we could do that. Oh yes, please, yes. Let's do season <laughs> predictions. Absolutely, can't wait for that. All right, we'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks, Will. It's Will Haskett here on the Fan Midday Show. Brooks Kefka for the third time wins the Wanamaker Trophy, capturing the PGA Championship at Oak Hill. We will take a quick break. When we return, we'll revisit a little bit of our NBA conversation before taking that full throttle as Kyle Irving will join us at the top of the hour. does a great job covering the NBA. Two series, both conference finals, 3-0 leads are there. Any comebacks, or do we basically already have our NBA finals matchup set in stone? We'll have that conversation with Kyle Irving next on The Fan. Your neighbor, Mark.
The Fan. But well, along with our conversation with Will Haskett on the PGA Championship podcast will be up a little bit later today on 1075thefan.com or wherever you get your podcast. The Church the Fan midday show. It is race week and there is still time. Limited tickets still available for Tales from the Track tonight with Ed Carpenter hosted by Hammer and Nigel. Going to be a fun event. Plenty of laughs, plenty of beer, great time all across the board to start your waste week off right. That is tonight, 6 to 8 p.m., right in this very building, but in the lobby of MS Communications here on The Circle. Go to WIBC.com. That's WIBC.com. You'll get dinner. You'll get a drink ticket, registration for door prizes, a QA and a with Ed, meet and greet photo opportunities as well. It's the perfect way to start your race week. That is tonight, 6 to 8 p.m., Eastern at the MS Communications Lobby. That's my broadcasting fault. Not sure why you needed the time zone there. You know what time it is, but it is what it is. <laughs> WIBC.com to be a part of Tales from the Track with Ed Carpenter. Limited tickets still available there. When we return, we'll have a conversation with Kyle Irving. He will take us through the NBA playoffs to this point and if the tickets to the NBA finals are already set or if history could potentially be made out east or out west. We'll discuss on the Fan Midday Show.
Drive, The Fan. Back here in the DriveHubler.com studio, I'm James Boyd with Jimmy Cooks cooking it up with Eddie Garrison on The Fan Midday Show, 107.5-935. Thank you all for tuning in. We now have Kyle Irving, not Kyrie, (laughs) (laughs) Kyle Irving, who covers the NBA for Sporting News, NBA Canada. So maybe we'll ask him about Jamal Murray and other things like that. But to start off, Kyle, not Kyrie, how you doing? I'm doing well. I appreciate you clarifying that for all the listeners out there. Oh, man, it happens every time. Um, Quick story, I reached out to Kyle last year when I was doing Pacers pre-draft stuff, and I was like, I want to talk to this guy just because I know he gets this joke over and over again about the Kyle Kyrie thing. But our eyes went wide when you sent that when you sent his contact card into the group chat last night. I was very confused at a lot going on, Kyle, and I was like, what, "James is just just on a first name basis with Kyrie. What's going on?" And then he's like, "No, no, it's Kyle," and he actually steers into the skid with the joke. You can follow him on Twitter at Kyle Irv underscore. So yeah, it was it was very just what? And then oh okay, now I understand what's going on type of deal. I, I'm sure you get it all the time. Yeah, I do. I mean, Kyrie Irving coming on to talk about the Boston Celtics meltdown would definitely be something. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, before we get into the current NBA playoffs and just the holes that, you know, two teams find themselves in, you know, you do a lot of things year round to prepare for the draft. What do you think of the spot the Pacers are in at number seven and the potential of who could fit there for this team moving forward? I actually do like where the Pacers are at at number seven because – you know, on my draft board right now, the only team that I see uh, drafting for a similar fit as they need at, at that power forward position, you know, a little bit of front court help is the Pistons. Um, you know, right now I have Jarris Walker from Houston uh, mocked to the Pistons at number five. I've seen Cam Whitmore there. Um, those are two players that I really think would be a fantastic fit to the Indiana Pacers. I think there's three players total that I have on my eye for Indiana, and that's Cam Whitmore, Jarris Walker, and also Taylor Hendricks out of UCF. I mean, starting with Cam Whitmore from Villanova, he's extremely explosive. He's an incredible athlete. He kind of got off to a slow start at the beginning of the year because he had thumb surgery in the preseason. But he's the type of player, he almost reminds me of like an Aaron Gordon, Uh, you know, really solid defender. He's still a little bit raw as an offensive player, as a scorer. But I think a playmaker like Tyree Talliburton would really get the most out of him. Um, I also think that, you know, Jairus Walker, he's someone who is one of the best defenders, all-around defenders in this draft class. In my opinion, he's someone that, that I think could also be there at number seven if the Pacers, don't, I mean, uh, if the Pistons don't scoop him up. He's so physical. Uh, you know, he's an inside out presence. He displayed a little bit of an ability to shoot the three ball. He's a little bit more raw offensively than, say, you know, Cam Whitmore is. But, you know, the defense is absolutely there inside and out. He's someone that could anchor the paint and play the five if he needed to as a small ball center. Um, he can defend on the perimeter because he has a lateral quickness. So those are two players that I really like for Indiana, and I'd be surprised if they don't end up with one of those players on their draft board when they go to pick at number seven. Gotcha. And so one of the guys, you touched on him a little bit there, Taylor Hendricks. I feel like he's, I don't want to say unknown, but sort of a dark horse, potential top five type of pick. And so what are some things about his game that are it seems like becoming more enticing to, not NFL, I'm sorry. (laughs) I've been in the NFL too long, I'm sorry. (laughs) NBA GMs and, you know, decision makers. Yeah, he's someone that I don't really think was even on mock draft boards going into the season. I mean, he's a freshman. He's a little bit more unheralded, uh, you know, going to UCF, not some sort of high major powerhouse uh, school. But I think what makes him so special and what's, you know, why he's skyrocketing up mock draft boards is because he really is the exact prototype of what you're looking for in a forward in today's NBA. You know, he's a stretch forward. He's six foot nine. He's 210 pounds. His wingspan's over seven feet. He shot almost 40% from three point range this year at UCF. Um, you know, he can defend inside and out again, versatile defender. Uh, I think when you combine his blocks and steals, he averaged uh, 2.6 uh, stocks, as we call it, uh, per game. So he's someone that, you know, even though he wasn't this, you know, high major five star superstar recruit going into college. He proved that he can do all the things that NBA scouts and GMs and coaches are looking for at the NBA level. And I really do think that, you know, just because even though he wasn't, you know, the the big time college player, I do think that he's someone that uh, teams will start looking at in the top 10 just because of how well his game fits at the NBA level. Kyle Irving with us here on the Fan Midday Show, produces content and covers the draft for Sporting News as well as for NBA Canada with us here on the Fan Midday Show. It feels like for the last, 
I don't know, six months, maybe more, Kyle, that Scoot Henderson went from maybe being in a conversation as, I, I won't say just as talented at Wembenyama because that story's been here for the last year, year and a half, but it felt like just as valuable, depending on where you are as a franchise, trying to build a mold or set yourself up for success in the future. When you look at Wembenyama having fully dwarfed everybody in terms of coverage, in terms of just hype, everything else, and, and he's backed it up on the court as well, where does it leave guys like Scoot Henderson and Brandon Miller in this draft cycle when they probably internally feel like they can be high-level impact franchise guys for whatever team takes them? Yeah, I mean, when Scoot Henderson and Victor Weminyama had that showcase at the beginning of the year, um, I was lucky enough to be on hand for that. And it really did kind of feel like, you know, even though Weminyama was always going to be the number one pick, that was never a doubt, uh, there was – you know, a pretty, it felt pretty sure that Scoot Henderson was going to be the number two guy. And as the season went on, obviously, Brandon Miller emerged. Again, I think that's another player who he just fits the way that the game is played at the NBA level so well. Uh, as a three-level scorer, he's, you know, big, a big forward. He is an absolute sniper from three-point range, uh, knocking down almost 40% of his threes as well. He can get it done in a variety of ways. And when you look at the Hornets who are picking at number two, they really need more of a wing scorer. Uh, than they do a lead guard like Scoot Henderson because obviously LaMelo Ball is the future of the franchise there. But, you know, to me, the Hornets are not good enough to really be drafting to fit a need. And I'm still so high on Scoot Henderson as the clear number two prospect in this draft class. He's just so physically mature. He's, you know, he's got broad shoulders. He's absolutely jacked. Uh, You know, he's extremely explosive. He has a turbo button when he's getting downhill to the rim. And, you know, he's a sniper from the mid-range. His his inconsistency from three-point range is something that, A lot of people are concerned about how that's going to translate at the next level, but he is kind of a combo guard. I think he could play off LaMelo Ball. The Hornets could find a way to make it work. And more so than anything else, Scoot Henderson is going to work until he is one of the best guards in the NBA. He's a workhorse. He's someone that the only things that matter to him are his family and basketball. He's a rel- he has a relentless work ethic, and everybody around him speaks so highly of you know his intelligence and just hunger to get better. And you know it's those types of things that make me feel just a little bit more certain about how he's going to pan out at the NBA level. So you know Brandon Miller, in, in, he's an incredible player. He's a really really strong shooter. He's a versatile defender. If the Hornets do go with him at number two overall to fit a need, I would understand it. I'm just saying that if I'm the if I'm the decision maker uh, in that situation, I'm going Scoot Henderson at number two all day. Kyle, we've seen you know some recent lottery picks in the NBA take jumps. Most notably, I think SGA, who has just been phenomenal, the first team All NBA. I thought he was incredible. I also thought that Tyrese Halliburton, the jump that he made, was pretty incredible, and maybe he could have even contended for an All-NBA spot had the team record been better and had he stayed healthier. But what did you think of the way he maybe asserted himself more offensively while still being able to distribute and, um, you know, average over 10 assists a game? Yeah, Tyree Tolliver, and he's someone who, you know, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I haven't had draft misses. I have certainly had draft misses. But I actually have an article out there uh, from Tyree Tolliver's draft class uh, on how he is, the most underrated player in his draft class. He was someone who coming out, I was just so impressed with his playmaking. It just seemed like the game came so easy to him. Um, You know, he's got that quirky jump shot, but he's found a way to make it work. And we're seeing all that stuff translate to the NBA level. Um, He really is just one of the most special playmakers in the NBA today. I do think that, you know, you compared him to SGA in in that type of beat that he had. And I do agree with you that he could have received all NBA consideration had he been healthy and had the Pacers you know, kind of maintain the energy they had at the beginning of the season. But, you know, Tyrese Halliburton is someone who I would be very confident uh, as a franchise cornerstone. He's someone who, no matter who's around him, he's going to make the players around him better because he's just that special of a playmaker. Uh, you know, he's a, a true 2010 threat as a point guard, which is incredible. Um, you know, he's someone that is easy to build around. When you're talking, you know, I'm looking at, okay, who's going to fit well in Indiana when I'm looking at this year's draft class, and I think about, how well he could make, uh, you know, how much easier he could make life for someone like Cam Whitmore, who needs to uh, get better at creating for himself. Uh, how much easier he can make life for someone like Jarris Walker, who's a little bit more raw, uh, raw offensively, but has all the physical tools and athleticism to be a threat around the rim. So, you know, I think when you have a player like Hal Burden as your franchise cornerstone, it just makes building a team so much easier because you can be confident in his ability to uplift everyone around him. 
We'd be remiss not to give a little bit of love to our, our local prospects that could potentially be at the next level when the draft rolls around in June. Obviously, it's unknown if Zach Eady is going to take his name out of the draft or not. That's still a conversation if he's going to return to Purdue. But on the other side of the state with Indiana, Jalen hood Shafino, Trace Jackson Davis, where do you see them mocking out or the type of benefits they could have as you kind of progress out their career, assuming they get the right fit from the team that takes them? Yeah, I mean, right away, Jalen Huchifino, he's someone who I feel like I'm personally higher on the most. Um, I know the highs were high this year and the lows were low this year, but just, you know, having that experience running a pick-and-roll offense at Indiana with Trace Jackson Davis the way that he did this season, uh, I was really impressed with him in the games that he played well. Obviously, the games that he didn't, you know, you kind of wonder how this guy is ending up in the lottery on some mock drafts, but I have him mocked to the Raptors at number 13 right now. Um, the Raptors are a team that Fred Van Vliet, they're not sure if he's going to pick up his player option this offseason. Gary Trent Jr., it's looking like he's heading out the door. So they really need a lead guard. And the Raptors have such a history of developing talent that I feel like Jalen Hutchfino would be a great fit there. And I do see him as a lottery caliber talent. Um, you know, I have him graded in my on my big board as a lottery caliber talent at number 13. Uh, Trace Jackson Davis is another player who, you know, to me, he feels like a first rounder because he just, does everything so well like he plays the game at such a high level and he was such a productive player in college that even though he's a little bit undersized and he can't shoot from the perimeter um you know which are things that would kind of deter you from taking a small ball you know power forward or center uh, at the nba level he just does so many other things whether it's you know setting something as simple as setting screens boxing out grabbing rebounds making the hustle plays being in the right spot at the right time he's going to be able to rotate on defense and switch onto the perimeter and those are the types of intangibles that you know you see from teams in the playoffs right now. I mean, a lot of teams are playing a lot smaller. Uh, I see a Trace Jackson Davis as the type of player who could fit in a playoff rotation and kind of like step out onto the floor and be able to guard multiple positions and do different things. So, you know, for those two, I'm really high on both of them. I have them both graded as first-round talent. Zach Eady, obviously a little bit more difficult of a situation just because, you know, again, using the playoffs right now as an example, it's very tough to find a spot on the floor for someone that big who can get targeted in pick and roll situations and everything like that. Obviously, if he declares, I do think a team, uh, whether it's somewhere in the second round, will give him a shot uh, just because obviously he was so good this year and he's so big. And, you know, there, there are situations in the regular season to use a guy like that. It's just going to be tough to keep him on the floor in the playoffs, which is why, you know, he's not projected as a first round talent, even though he was one of the best players in college basketball. So, Kyle, we saw this morning Carmelo Anthony announced his retirement from the game. One of my favorite players to watch as a kid because I just thought in his prime he would just bully people and then have that feathery jump shot that I feel like I airballed a lot trying on my driveway because he shot it so high. (laughs) But for you, what will stand out to you the most about Carmelo's career? Man, I love Carmelo Anthony, too. Stay mellow forever. He is uh, you know, he, I feel like he's just a, he's a fan favorite across the board, even though people, you know, want to talk about you know, lack of a championship and, you know, how he didn't win and things like that. I'm always going to remember him as just one of the most lethal scorers that I have ever seen. You get him in that high post, that mid-range level, and it just felt like it was going down every single time. Uh, and, you know, even if it's just something as simple as the three balls of the head celebration, that's something that, you know, I'll probably be playing pickup and still try and break that out <laughs> if I get a little bit of a hot streak. So, for real, stay mellow forever. Kyle Irving with us of the Sporting News. Looking at the ongoing conference finals, I want to first start out East. There were jokes amongst some of the Miami media and some Miami fans before the playoffs started that they really wanted to match up with Boston. There's obviously a lot of bad blood between those two franchises, and it didn't happen, right? They had to go against the Bucs, but Miami, it doesn't matter. They're able to take advantage of every opportunity that they've had, and to this point are on the doorstep of really in some regards, an improbable run to the NBA finals. What, where's the biggest switch that's flipped outside of playoff Jimmy? I mean, obviously that, that matters the most, but you had mentioned on Twitter during the proceedings there, Kyle, that it felt like Miami or Boston rather treated this as a game four in game three. And honestly, looked like they had their bags packed, ready to walk away and head to Cancun. Yeah, I mean, that was just an extremely, extremely disappointing level of effort shown by the Celtics. Um, I actually thought they came out with a little bit of fire yesterday, and Jalen and Jason played well in the first quarter. But then when the heat punched back, the Celtics kind of just rolled over and were like, yeah, well, you know what, you guys can have this one too. Um, To me, I think the biggest difference, obviously, is the contributors from 
you know, guys that aren't Jimmy Butler. I mean, you look at Gabe Vincent, who outscored Jalen Brown and <laughs> Jason Tatum combined yesterday, and obviously they didn't play in the fourth quarter, so that jades the numbers a little bit. But, you know, Gabe Vincent outscoring uh, Boston's dynamic duo. You have guys like Max Struess, Caleb Martin, who are shooting the lights out. Duncan Robinson was getting it done on the floor yesterday, and the Celtics weren't attacking him to the point where, you know, Spo had to pull him off the floor. I mean, the Heat are shooting the lights out from three-point range. Gabe Vincent is shooting 38% in these playoffs. Max Struess, 37%. Caleb Martin is shooting 42% from three. Duncan Robinson, almost 45%. You know, it, it, it makes life a lot easier for guys like Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler when the other players around them are knocking down shots to the point that you really need to stay out on the perimeter, and you can't really double down on Van. You can't really throw two bodies at Jimmy because other guys are beating you. But, you know, for the Celtics, it's kind of the same story as last year that almost got them bounced by the Heat in the Eastern Conference Finals. They can't beat that zone. They're not moving the ball. They're, I mean, they're, the ball is sticking. They're forcing up bad shots. Uh, Jalen and, and Jason are just kind of driving into multiple bodies, turning the ball over. It's the same issues that we saw last year, and they were able to get out by the skin of their teeth last season. But this year, the defense is not at the same level as it was last year, and that's the biggest difference for this Celtics team. They're not coming up with stops. The offense has gotten stagnant. And to me, honestly, I think they're getting up out of here in four games tomorrow. Yeah, I was very shocked to see them just fall apart yesterday. The Lakers could get swept tonight, quite honestly. What do you think they have to do to stay alive, if they can stay alive, not to take anything away from the Nuggets because they've been fantastic, and I personally think that it's going to end tonight. But, you know, I guess as Jokic said, you're always a little worried because LeBron James on the other side. Do they have enough to get a game tonight at home and, I guess, force their season to at least go back to Denver? I think they actually have a better chance of winning tonight than the Celtics do tomorrow just by body language and, you know, how hard the Lakers played in that game the other night. I think that was an instance where, you know, Jamal Murray catches fire in the first half, scores 30, and the Celtics, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the Lakers really just had no answer. So, you know, Nikola Jokic, he kind of had a quiet game all the way until he put him away in the fourth quarter with 15 points. Uh, so to me, it really is just kind of making sure that Jamal Murray does not get out out to a scorching hot start the way he did the other night because that allows Jokic to kind of, you know, ease his way into the game and create for others and do the things that he does best when he's not scoring for himself. And then by the time that the fourth quarter rolled around, he had all the energy in the world to, you know, kind of put his foot on the gas a little bit and then defeat the Lakers to get out to a 3-0 start. So to me, really, it, it starts with making sure Jamal Murray does not, you know, scorch earth the way that he did the other night. If they can kind of contain him in the first quarter and, and, you know, maybe make life a little bit more difficult for him, then I think the Lakers have an opportunity to kind of extend this series and get it done on the home floor, on their home floor. But I really would give them a better chance of closing – or I'd give them a better chance of winning tonight than I'd, I would give the Celtics tomorrow night. In fear of having Michael Malone yell at me for not giving the Nuggets enough love. <laughs> <laughs> What did you think of not only, I mean, we know Jokic is Jokic. He's, in my opinion, arguably the best player in the world. You look at what Jamal Murray is doing, and when he's on, he is one of the best players on the floor, one of the best players in the world. But that supporting cast around him, around them, rather, is what stands out to me the most. So what do you think of the way that Michael Porter Jr., Bruce Brown, KCP, these guys have stepped up and sort of seized the moment alongside their two leaders? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, part of what makes the Nuggets so dangerous is they really don't care how they beat you. You know, Jokic doesn't mind if he has 15 points, uh, if he's going to dish out 15 assists and KCP is going to be shooting the lights out and so is MPJ. And I think it just goes to show, you know, how much of a team they truly are and why they've been the best team the entire postseason so far. Because you have guys like Bruce Brown, who, who are stepping up and having, you know, a monster game in game two. You have guys like Aaron Gordon, who have really kind of put his pride aside as a scorer and is just going out there and doing his best to lock up whoever the other team's best player is. So, you know, it, these championship teams, it's a sum of all parts. It's never really going to just be one or two guys. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing from the Nuggets. It is, you know, the it, it's kind of like a banner for just team basketball and next man up and whoever has the hot hand, we're going to ride that. And I think the Nuggets have a couple guys on the perimeter and, you know, guys that are willing to grind it out that they trust, uh, whether that's KCP, whether it's MPJ, uh, Aaron Gordon, Bruce Brown, those types of guys are ready to step up whenever their number is called. But at the same time, like you said, you have the two-time MVP, Nikola Jokic, and Jamal Murray, who is right now one of the most dangerous players in the playoffs when he gets going. So, you know, it could be any guy on any given night. 
Kyle Irving of the Sporting News with us here on the Fan Midday Show. Kyle, the Heat are up 3-0. The Nuggets are up 3-0. When you look at the Lakers and the Celtics, I think we're all in agreement that all these series are pretty much dead to rights and it's a foregone conclusion. But if you had to attach your wagon to one to become the first team to climb out of a 3-0 hole, which would it be and why? It's funny to say because I just said the Lakers have a better chance of winning tonight than the Celtics do tomorrow. <laughs> but if I if I could pick one team to climb out of the 3-0 hole, I think it would be the Celtics. Just because I don't know how many people wouldn't agree that they are still the more talented team. They just haven't wanted it as much as the Heat have in this series. But, you know, I think tomorrow we're going to see plenty of, uh, you know, Kevin, Kevin Millar clips on Twitter of don't let us win tonight. <laughs> yes, back from the yes. Red Sox. <laughs> You're going to see a lot of that tomorrow. And I don't know if the Celtics even have enough heart to kind of, you know, have that don't let us win tonight mentality. But, you know, if they were to pull it off tomorrow night, then you're going back to Boston uh, for game five. You win that, you're going to Miami, where they've honestly played better on the road. And yesterday didn't really show that, but they played better on the road in this postseason. So, and then it would be back to home in Boston for a game seven. So I would probably give the Celtics a better chance to climb out of a 3 0 hole, even though I just said they're dead in the water tomorrow. Well, Kyle, I really appreciate your time, man. I do want to say, since we had you on the show here in Indy, I expect your next mock draft to feature Victor Woman Yambet number seven to the Pacers <laughs> because we all know it's going to happen. <laughs> but um, take care, buddy. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll make sure to check in with you throughout you know, the, the, the draft process and things like that because I'm sure you're going to cook up a lot of good things. Of course. Anytime, guys. Thank you so much for having me. That is Kyle, not Kyrie, Kyle Irving of the Sporting News, NBA Canada. Nice enough to join us here on the Midday Show. The fan, I mean, he said it. I do agree with him, Jimmy, that the Celtics probably have the best chance of climbing out of the 0-3 hole because they are the more talented team. But this is where we had this debate off air the other day. Is effort a skill? Because I think, and even if it isn't, the point is, the Heat play with more effort than the Celtics, it seems like to me. I don't know you know, how much you can get into their psyche and say how many guys are trying as hard as they possibly can, but from a desperation standpoint, you would think that the Heat were the team that was down 0-2 yesterday with the way they came out and played. We joked about it. Like, it's not a skill, but there are levels for where you get maxed out, where like you're ready to tap out, how far you can actually take your body, your physical limitations, but giving up or not giving up is a choice, right? Like, like you can get dominated one-sidedly, but in terms of just the response that is needed for a team as highly regarded as Boston, like, do I think, like, in in general, that any of those athletes were necessarily mailing it in? No, but but you can get broken by another team. They got broken by the Heat in Game 3. Like, they like they, they did. They came out firing to start. Miami punched back, and that was it. There was no, there was no more get-up for Boston. So... While we could debate whether or not effort actually is a skill, the willingness to not give up and not be broken, like you need to have more fortitude than that, particularly for a franchise as sound as Boston usually is. That being said, I joke about it all the time. My my only uh, you know relation to this is if we're playing video games or whatever, <laughs> and like we're playing some Rocket League or some Madden, or if I'm playing with some buddies and we're down in a big hole, like even even as a Yankees fan, like that Kevin Plar, don't, don't let us win tonight. Don't give us a game tonight. <laughs> like like yeah, that, that's very much what it is for Boston at this point. It's 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 sad that they're at this point, given how favored they were both to start the series and to start the postseason outside of Milwaukee. But yeah, that's it. Like th- that's all you have is get one more ounce of hope and just get one and then worry about the rest as it comes because, to Kyle's point, Boston is the better roster. They've not been the better team this series. They've not. No, no, not at all. I do think that you know there is some level of hope for the Lakers to just not get swept. I don't think they're going to win the series at all at this point. Um, I will say this. This does not affect LeBron's legacy at all. I think it's funny when you get to – certain stages of your career and you've accomplished so much and people think that reaching the conference finals is somehow a slight on your resume and the conversation with him has always been uh pretty crazy and i think that we're gonna enter some of that same territory for better or worse with victor women yamba where you set the expectations so high and you move the goalposts no matter what happens for lebron he was getting compared to Kareem and Wilt and Magic when he was in high school. And we're talking about a guy who's now the all-time leading scorer in the NBA. Is it a slight on his legacy because he loses to the number one seed 
as a number seven seed. Now, I will say this. They didn't go into this talking like they were going to just concede or they were okay with getting here. You know, I remember AD saying, hey, we're hungry for another one. And you haven't gotten a game off of these guys where other teams have. Timberwolves won a game. The Suns won two. I do think if you're LeBron and AD, you should win a game. But even if you don't, big picture wise, it doesn't matter because I feel like this is going on a crash course now for Heat Nuggets and for everyone out there saying, oh, the ratings, who cares? Like, you do not own these stations. Who cares about <laughs> ratings? You know, if you like basketball, tune in because you will see some good basketball. You don't get to this level in the playoffs or this far in the playoffs without playing high level, really fun basketball. I mean, the storyline is going to be through the roof, and we'll dive into that as we get closer and closer to the NBA Finals. But I'm going to try not to be too much with hyperbole here as we step aside. But Jimmy Butler has the opportunity to have one of the greatest individual postseason runs in the history of the NBA. Like that. Like I'm not saying the all-time best, but one of them, if they're able to take care of Boston and then defeat Denver, who even though no one's wanted to talk about it all year, has looked like the best team in the league for the majority of the season. So the whole process, again, starts with closeout game opportunities for the Nuggets tonight. You'll be able to hear that on the fan at 9 o'clock in progress after Beyond the Bricks at 8 and trackside at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, Boston and Miami, a closeout game for the Heat tomorrow as we get closer and closer to the NBA Finals. When we return, is Sam Ellinger's name going to become... A lot more interesting in the Colts quarterback room. We'll discuss when we come back on 93.5-1075 The Fan.
Fan. Jimmy Cook and James Boyd here on the Fan Midday Show with Eddie Garrison. Thanks for hanging with us throughout the afternoon. Sam Ellinger's name might carry a little bit more weight within that Colts quarterback room, James, with a uh, new proposal at the, uh, what is it this time? It's the NFL Spring League meetings, finance meetings in Minnesota, any type of just more... I don't want to call it HR work because there's a lot of money at stake with the, with the sales <laughs> of the commanders uh, ongoing there as well. Jim Ursay making some comments about that. We can get into that here too. But no longer will there be a, a penalization on your active roster count to be able to carry that third quarterback now on the depth chart. Basically, I don't want to call it the 49ers rule, the Brock Purdy rule, but we, we saw it was on display in the NFC Championship game where Christian McCaffrey was having to to warm up and, and give it a go uh, during the course of that game in January. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised that it actually <laughs> went through as quick as it did. I did not expect this rule to be changed because it felt like such a unique situation that teams are rarely ever in. And I know the argument from the Eagles' standpoint, or at least some of their fan base is, well, if you protected your quarterback, you wouldn't have to worry about you know needing another one. And so I guess it's a cool little uh, wrinkle that they've added. It doesn't hurt anyone, obviously, and it helps the product on the field. And I do think had the 49ers had another quarterback, they still would have lost because at that point you're going to your number three guy. Um, I guess it helps for Sam Ellinger. We'll see him in a lot more game gear, assuming that all three quarterbacks make the 53-man roster at the end of the um, summer, which I expect to happen. I don't see why you wouldn't have them maybe you know is sam a practice squad guy do you weigh that factor into it but seeing as he made the team last year it could be a little bit different now that you have a new coach in there and he's obviously a decision maker when it comes to the roster and what needs you want to you know uh, exercise or focus on with your spots but um i wouldn't be surprised obviously to see you know three quarterbacks suit up for the Colts because at that point you never want to put your team at a disadvantage by not taking advantage of the new rule and to clarify it a little bit, so teams could always have had a third quarterback yeah. on their roster. Yeah. This is just opening things up so that they could have an, an additional active player on the roster that's exclusively for that emergency quarterback situation. Um, Jeff Schwartz is interacting with all this on Twitter, at Jeff Schwartz, and I'm on the show a handful of times over the last couple of months. And he's right, it is funny that the that the story is getting a ton of weight, even though teams could have done it before, but now they obviously have this luxury uh, of, of this extra spot in theory in case of emergencies. He also goes on to say, and I, I agree with him in this regard, James, is that it doesn't matter who was going to come out there for the 49ers once they got that far down the depth chart. Was it probably going to change the course of how that game went? No, it was it was a straight schlacking by Philadelphia across the board, but the idea of still having one more avenue to go through when some were making the argument that, hey, almost anybody could run that San Francisco 49ers offense and how good it is, it's not going to work for every team, and I still don't think it changes the outcome of the NFC Championship game this past January, but it got to a point where the game was completely unwatchable to an extent because of how that yeah, they might as well just punt on first down with how limited <laughs> the 49ers offense was at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, you got... You know, uh, George Kittle asking Brock Purdy, can he throw lefty? And, you know, Chris McCaffrey going back there because he's just the best athlete. And at that point, you don't see that unless you're covering a high school team. Right. You know what I mean? Where obviously that is not working the pros. But, I mean, it's something that you'll hear about for a few weeks, if that. And then we'll move on to more important things, more important happenings. Obviously, the biggest of which being um, at the moment the sale of the Washington Commanders. And if that goes through, I know owner, Colts owner Jim Ursay is there at the meetings. He was saying nothing's been finalized, and he alluded to how complicated the negotiations have become year after year because more money is involved. And as you know, Jimmy, with anything in life, whenever there's more money involved, there's more conversation, there's more dialogue, there's more, hey, let me go back and rethink this. And so I know that's how it is for me, for example, when I go to get my car. And they say, I got to need an oil change. And they tell me I need an XYZ change. And the bill goes from, <laughs> I don't know, 100 bucks to, hey, this might be 500. I'm like, wait a second. Right, right. Let's Pause talk about this. <laughs> you know, let's have a discussion. And so, obviously, I, I'm not comparing that to selling a team or it's or real world, a though. Team, You're right. I mean, money changes things. And so, um, this will obviously be a huge sale um, for the league. And honestly, the league was probably thinking about 
the fact that, hey, we want to be able to say we sold this team for this much. Look at us. Look at our league. Look at how much money we're making. Um, you know, companies, brands, people continue to invest in us because obviously the return on that investment has been huge. Six point oh eight billion dollars. I just want 6. the point oh five. Let me correct that. Sorry. I just want I the oh five. Just just chop somebody change. chop that <laughs> chop that oh five off and just send I've got that oh six to on me. Now. You know, so <laughs> We just round it up a little bit and just spread, spread it amongst ourselves. I mean, I'm sure the three of us can get to 07. We, yeah. we, we could find some negotiations. Oh, we're not talking dimes and pennies, are we? <laughs> oh, man. I, I hope you are. <laughs> it is fascinating, though, that even, I mean, even in this league, it's never anything simple, right? I get it. It's a multi billion dollar acquisition. So you want to make sure that you're going over with a fine tooth comb and make sure everything is is perfect. And of course, there's a little extra dressing here locally with, with Jim Ursay, of course, being one of the owners on the NFL Finance Committee and, and just him being so outspoken, rightfully so, in some regard, with 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 the need for new ownership in Washington and 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 the just overall the NFL wanting to turn a new page with this. But yeah, I mean that's who would have thought that when you have a, a six point oh five billion dollar application of sale going on that there would be some stuff you need to look into and, and dive into and make sure everything's perfect. You know, I mean it's it is the perfect microcosm of what the NFL is in terms of just being an absolute monster that yeah, this is the value of teams right now. This is where, as the revenue stream continues to go up and up and up over time, this is what you have to deal with. Now, I think personally, though, and this is from this is ignorance. This is shouting into the void that I would think it's enough cushion between now and the start of the regular season that you would hope you would be able to finalize all of that. But again, that's a position of ignorance. I have no idea how long it ordinarily should take. You think they're doing background checks? And that's what's taking so long. <laughs> Or I'm reckoning them going, you know, hey, you got to do a mandatory drug test to make sure you qualify for this sale, things yeah, like that. Yeah. But they, uh, um, the the, the uh, ownership bid, they didn't all have their passports. They didn't have all the legal documents. Yeah, they had to you know, double w, check that, you know. Need your W-2, <laughs> verify social security number. But in all seriousness, I don't know with the commanders because they've been such and such a wild card, quite frankly, uh, with the way that they've operated under the Dan Snyder um, leadership. And so you just never know. And I think Jim Irsay, at least when he was, uh, the stuff that I saw on Twitter reading his, some of his comments, he and many other owners are just basically saying nothing is final until it is final. And so uh, the NFL, I'm sure, will be very relieved whenever this transaction goes through because you have a team in the nation's capital and everything that's talked about them is not something that's positive, which is you know, just kind of ridiculous considering – um, what that brand has been um, before that leadership, that ownership group, and now potentially afterward. That one of the major NFL stories today. The other one, of course, the NFL looking into a, a second wave of gambling, potential violations of their gambling policy within the league itself. I, I proposed this during the break. And again, maybe somebody on the YouTube chat or you can mention us on Twitter at Romeoville Kid, at Eddie Garrison underscore at the Jay Cook. This is again, again, another position of ignorance for me. You would think with the NFL's partnership with sports books, there'd be a way, and James told me this is way too smart of me, and like this <laughs> couldn't work. You just look at a smart idea like this that it's too easy. No way it could work. You would think there's a way with all the data that is required to sign up with digital sports books of giving your social security number, giving all these other identifiers out to be able to sign up, that there will be a cross-reference database somewhere of, well, no, actually you're employed with the NFL or you're employed with, like you, you are unable to place wagers in this category or overall as a whole. Eddie made the point it shouldn't be on the sports books, and I agree it shouldn't be on the sports books, but if you're the NFL and you're really trying to be proactive with this, you would think there would be a pathway to limit or have a red flag immediately when a player tries to sign up with a sports book or tries to place an NFL wager. Perhaps what I'm speaking is way ahead of its time and too science fiction to actually be possible, but one would think there would be a way to place real safeguards in the league in that regard. That's what I think too, but as I joke with you, I guess it's just too easy. I think that a lot of decisions that are made throughout the world are very difficult. Yeah. I mean, my mom works in insurance. I tell her all the time. I understand why people call your job and, and, and yell at you and others. You know, I wouldn't do it. I love you, mom. But I'm like, why is this so complicated? And so I do think that the league um, 
will probably have to revisit a lot of what they're doing with the partnerships and how that affects the players and the conversation they have with players. I'm sure they go over this stuff in detail, um, you know, with the rookies, with players. However, for whatever reason, it keeps falling on deaf ears. And so I do think they're going to ramp up something or do something where they're forcing these players to really understand what they're getting themselves into. That way we hopefully don't have these incidents keep happening because obviously as fans, we want to see every player be available um, for the team that we're rooting for. And on the other side of the coin, as we step away, again, if you have a gambling problem, by all means, you know, 1-800-9 with it. There, there, there are avenues out there to be able or to get gambler. yourself checked. There you go. Appreciate Yeti uh, for covering us there. But also for the casual fan or even the hardcore fan like myself, like you, like Eddie, I mean, I know that it's different for you since you're actually on the beat, but like, I enjoy being able to place a casual wager. Like as a fan, like I should be able to do that with with how the rules and laws are set in place, and the fact the NFL can't get a handle on it within their own house is wildly maddening. And something needs to be changed. What that is, I don't know. Maybe my solution is too easy, but something has to be able to give with this process. Uh, otherwise, you're going to continue to see head scratching, suspensions, and confusion for how the NFL is running things internally. And that's a fun pivot to say we have bets for you around the corner here on the Fan Midday Show. I'm sure Eddie will have some stuff. I have some action tonight for Game Four of the Western Conference Finals. Perhaps we can coax James into one as well. You got we the come broom. Back. What'd you say? You got the broom. I got the broom. Sweep. I got the broom out for the Nuggets, potentially. We'll see. We'll have to tease that on the other side when we come back here on the Fan Midday Show.
The Fan. Final time here on the Fan Midday Show on a Monday with Eddie Garrison and James Boyd. I am Jimmy Cook. Quick reminder for you, limited tickets still available for tonight's event in this very building in the MS Communications lobby from 6 to 8 p.m. It's Tales from the Track with Ed Carpenter, hosted by Hammer and Nigel. Going to be a full event full of laughs, beer, you can get dinner, a drink ticket, registration for door prizes, a Q&A with Ed, meet and greet photo opportunities as well. Get your tickets now, WIBC.com. Last chance to start your race week off right at Tales from the Track with Ed Carpenter. Speaking of starting your week off right, we're open to do so today with some bets here on The Fan. The Jay Cook Plays of the Day. This is me, all right? I'm not a athlete. This is my play. This is how I win. Today's Plays of the Day, we're going to lay one and a half on the run line for the Seattle Mariners. Last game of the night in the baseball slate against the Oakland Athletics. Switching over to the NBA Western Conference Finals. Going to be over 26 and a half total points for Jamal Murray. Into the closeout game, plus 130 is the juice I will take for the Denver Nuggets to sweep LeBron James for the third time in his career. 12 and 7 last week, looking to start race week off right. James, Eddie, any bets on your front in terms of tonight's slate? Any predictions for tonight's proceedings in the Western Conference Finals? No, I really like that Mariners bet. Castillo's on the mound. Really good matchup against the Athletics. He struggled lately, but I think he'll bounce back against a really subpar club today. That really warms my heart. Whenever I hear Eddie tell me that there's a baseball bet that he gives a, a, a <laughs> double stamp of approval on, it's just it, it it's I enough love, to get me through the day. Luis Castillo is one of my favorite players in the MLB as a former Red. Sure. I love the way he pitches and I love the way he plays the game. I think if you're a Lakers fan, you hope that the under for Jamal Murray hits <laughs> because I believe he scores over 26 and a half. The Lakers will be going home. Am I missing something with that, by the way? That feels really low. No, that's actually really high. I guess I'm just, I'm, I, there's recency bias in my head looking at what he's been able to do this series and, and throughout the just the, the last couple of series in the playoffs. But that, Eddie's, Eddie, Eddie's right. Eddie would know he tracks that better than anybody, but it, it feels perhaps. A little too good to be true. Well, Murray's like Jesus when he's out there playing against, <laughs> you know, the Lakers. He doesn't miss anything. The guy was shooting like 70, 80% for almost three straight quarters. And again, if he gets going tonight, Lakers, you know, LA, Cancun, figure out where you're going. Similar boat potentially tomorrow night when the Heat and the Celtics face off in Miami. And we talked about it throughout the show of either of these teams are able to make a run and perhaps turn the tide and become the first team in NBA history to come back from 3-0. It's tough sledding either way, James. Tough, tough sledding. I do think the Celtics have the best chance because they're the more talented team in their series at least. But Jimmy Butler and the Heat do not beat themselves, which is what the Celtics have always done, at least throughout this postseason, making things harder than they need to be. I won't say always. It's a little bit too harsh to make the Eastern Conference Finals. However, in this series alone, they made it very, very hard on themselves, and I think that that's going to come back to bite them with a potential sweep, or at least a gentleman sweep against the Heat. Tomorrow, Arenas VK, Elio Castroneves, and Mike Chappell will join us. James will be back in here until then. Right with JMV is next. Stay with us. Right home.